Testing. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. Two, three. Hello, Tess. Hey, Carol, can you hear me? You're not rubbing that. You can't hear me? <laughs> well, how about going to work? I'll tell you, that, you're talking about having to get into a mic. Look, if you talk back here, they won't even pick it up, will it? Hello, Tess. Hello, Tess. Somebody turn the mic back down again. Haven't you? No, I ain't no. Okay. Somebody needs to test from the back. Play that back. Keep talking. Oh, we get him. Sing a song. Let me go play the piano. Testing one, two, three. That's not on. That's not even on. That's dead. Well, now, which mic you want? It don't matter. Just one that works. Now then. Now the. Well, it should be. Well, it's not. If it was a man to go. No, right. yes, sir. I tell you, these mics, they can be turned up. to you 
the president of the State Labor Council, Brother Clark Ramsey, the man that will be in charge. Thank you, Brother Johnson. Let me say that I appreciate very much the attendance of this meeting today. I consider this convention to be one of the most important conventions that the state labor movements ever held in the state of Mississippi. I say that primarily because for the first time in my memory, in my lifetime as a matter of fact, we have an opportunity, a golden opportunity, to elect three friendly men to the Congress of the United States. And the emphasis in this convention will be placed upon these three elections, as you will learn later on when our report is presented to you. Now, <clears throat> my remarks will be brief, but it's going to be necessary for me to have a few words to say this morning that I had not planned to say because of a certain news story that has been showed, that they showed up in the newspapers in recent days, and it started last Saturday. I thank all of you present, familiar with the fact that, that I, Thomas Knight, and other members of the labor movement in this state spent many long hours <coughs> in an effort to bring about a unified Democratic Party in Mississippi that was open to everyone and that could win elections. I began my effort in this direction right after Bill Waller was elected governor of Mississippi. I asked for and received a conference with this gentleman right after he was elected because I didn't think that he understood the complicated situation he was about to get himself involved in. And after having spent about an hour with the governor on this complicated matter, he felt that it would be necessary for him to appoint somebody to represent his office to deal with the problem, that he didn't have the time. And I don't have time to get in all of the details of what transpired, but all of you should be familiar with the fact that we had a state convention, that we urged all of our people to participate in that convention, that I was a delegate at that convention, and that I offered a substitute motion that was adopted at that convention that established a five-member subcommittee to meet with the other group to try to work out a compromise whereby we'd have a unified Democratic Party. This committee failed to arrive at a compromise with the other group. Then we had some other things Develop. We had asked the loyalist group to meet with us in hopes that we might be able to convince them of the need of unity in the state. And some of these people actually insulted Claude Rams and Thomas Knight for having the audacity to ask them to meet with us about the matter. Frankly, they want to know who in the hell were we to ask them to meet with us. And I simply reminded them that I was president of the state FLCRO and that four years ago that I had virtually managed and run the Humphrey campaign. It seemed that they had short memories. Again, to make a long story short, we find ourselves in a rather complicated situation with a deadline having passed to file <coughs> uh, objections or protests with the Credentials Committee. And the governor went to court on the matter. 
I was asked to testify in federal court on this situation, and I did voluntarily go to Biloxi and testified in the hopes that my testimony might prompt the Credentials Committee of the Democratic Party to at least grant a hearing on the Mississippi situation. And I'm happy to report that that did result. I don't know whether my remarks had any merit, my uh, testimony before the court had anything to do with it or not, but the court, the judge, in his opinion, used two pages of that opinion on my testimony and about our activity in this area. And I'm of the opinion that that testimony did have a bearing on the fact that the Credentials Committee set up a special hearing on the Mississippi case. At the request of the governor of Mississippi, I went to Washington and testified at this hearing, which was held in Washington on June the 26th. This hearing lasted better than eight hours. The governor was kept on the stand for better than three hours and the attorney for the other group did his best to infuriate or excite or incite the governor. And he failed to do so, and I want you to know that I was very proud of the conduct of our governor at that hearing. He's done some things I don't necessarily agree with in recent months, but he did an excellent job on that witness stand. Now, I thought after we'd had that hearing that we had made some progress and that there would be a unified Democratic Party in this state. But I failed to underestimate the fact that certain people associated with the Loyalist faction who are white did not want a compromise worked out. I had no more and got back to Jackson on 4 o'clock on the morning of the 27th, which was, you know, the election day. And then I had agreed to go to Gulfport to attend the Ben Stone, ben Stone victory or Ben Stone wake, one of the two. And then when I got back to Jackson the following day, I spent about a half a day in my office. The following day in the late afternoon, I get another call from the governor's office wanting to know if I would be willing to go back to Washington, that they felt that I had some influence of certain members of the Credentials Committee, and that I might be able to convince the Credentials Committee to help work out a compromise whereby we'd have a unified party in our state. I didn't have time to check with the executive committee and anybody else. I had to make a decision. All night, we were there by ourselves. We talked about it. And we decided that it was important enough that I make another trip to Washington to make the effort. If we made the effort and failed, at least we knew we'd done everything that we could. And on top of that, even if we failed, <coughs> we felt that we might at least score some points with the governor. All right, so I went back to Washington and I worked uh, a couple of days getting trying to get things set up with the Credentials Committee. And the governor arrived the following day and I need to tell you about some of my experiences there because I'm doing this because of this things that's been in the press in recent days. First person that met me in Washington was a lady by the name of Pat Pat Patricia Darian, the National Committee woman for the Loyal Democrats. And she granted me, greeted me with these words. She heard I was in Washington to fight her. And I told her, I said, Pat, I'm not up here to fight anybody. I'm up here to see what I can do about bringing about a unified Democratic Party. And 
and I was there the night that they kicked uh, Dick Daly and the Chicago delegation out of the convention. Mr. Harding Carter was chairman or vice chairman of that committee. And I told Mr. Carter after the meeting was over with, I thought they just reelected Richard Nixon. He and I had some words about this matter. I told him, I asked him, how the devil you think you're going to win the state of Illinois without Chicago and Cook County? <coughs> well, it, anyhow, I'm just telling you all of this to let you know that I made the effort that I was insulted every time I turned around by certain people, <laughs> white people, not black people, that does not want a compromise worked out. I finally got things worked out to the point when the governor got there, that the governor designated me as his special representative to locate Mr. Aaron Henry, that he'd like to sit down and talk with him to see what could be worked out. So I found Mr. Henry, and I finally got him together. But the thing that's important for you to know about is that Harding Carter, Pat Therian, and the lawyer representing the lawyer list insisted on being in on the meeting. I'd hoped to set up a meeting with Aaron Henry and the lawyer and the governor and his lawyer, and out of this meeting maybe something could be worked out. But Mr. Carter was very arrogant about it all and insisted that the whole group meet with the governor, and they made demands upon the governor that Jesus Christ couldn't fulfill. They simply did not want to compromise worked out. And I want the delegates to this convention to know that I consider Mr. Harding Carter of Greenville, Mississippi, to be a phony and a faker of the first order. I think you need to know that about three white people in this state associated with the Loyalist Democratic Party themselves sabotaged all of our efforts to bring about a unified party in Mississippi. It was not the blacks. It was three whites. And the reason they didn't want a unified party centered around the fact that there wouldn't be a place for them and a unified party, so they thought. So I'd say to you today, the reason that we're in the position we're in today, that we don't have a unified party, can be traced to the actions of about three white individuals. And I have to let you know about that. Now, I wanted to tell you about this in order that you understand now about the report in the press. Some people have been concerned over the fact they thought that Claude Ramsey had resigned as president of the state FLCIO. I got some telephone calls about this. Well, this is what I'd agreed to do. I'd advise the governor and other parties concerned that I'd be willing to serve as a presidential elector if it would help bring about a unified party in our state. And the regular party, through its executive committee, designated me as a presidential elector at large. After the executive council, the FLCO had acted and took no position in the presidential election, and after having received the treatment that I received in Washington, I felt that I should resign or offer my resignation as a presidential elector. And I called Mr. Sonny Mike Donald up, the chairman of the party, and advised him this effect. And he wanted me to read, uh, write him a letter to this effect, which I did. And this letter was dated on August the 21st. And if I can read it, I'm going to read it to you, because this is where the news story began. I said, Dear Sonny, please be advised that I wish my name removed as a presidential elector in this year's election. As you know, the National FLCO has not taken an official position in the presidential election, 
and my name on the ballot could be mis misconstrued as me officially supporting Senator McGovern for president. I agreed to serve as an elector with my name on and have my name on the ballot if it would unify or help unify the Democratic Party in our state. Since we were unable to bring this badly needed unity about, I feel it will serve no useful purpose for me to remain as a presidential elector. Now this letter was dated on August the 21st. It's a couple of weeks later, to be exact, on September the 7th, Wilson Miner, a reporter with the Times Picayune, called my office said he had learned that I had resigned as a presidential elector. And I said, that's correct, Bill, but I'm curious as to where you got your information. He says, well, I got ways of finding out about it. I says, all right, I have, and I'll read you the letter, which I did. Then the story about the resignation appeared in the Times Picayune on September the 9th. Headline, Mississippi F.L. C.O. Head quits role as Democratic elector. The UPI wire service picked the story up. It's been carried around about the state. Bill Miner, in his Sunday column on Eyes on Mississippi, did a column on the whole situation about the role that the labor movement had played in past presidential electors and what it was going to mean in Mississippi for the CDF of LCO not to be able to participate in this one. I hope Mrs. Darian and Mr. Carter read this story. And I think <coughs> they'll understand before this election is over with how important we've been in past elections. That's the story. The reason I resigned as a presidential elector, number one, because <coughs> of the policy of the national organization, and number two, because we failed and our efforts to unify the party. That's the story. I thought you was entitled to that this morning before we got on with business at hand. We have much business to take care of. <coughs> we operate on a tight schedule this morning We'll have some business to do this afternoon, but we would like to get our business taken care of, our candidates, if you please, endorsed before lunch, at which time we'll have an address after lunch by the lieutenant governor <coughs> with addresses by the three endorsed candidates if you endorse them. So at this time, I'm going to find out if the credentials committee is ready to give its report. Brother Jackson? Brother Jackson is chairman of the Credentials Committee. Before he gets here, maybe I perhaps should give you the names of the committees that are, have been appointed to serve the convention. We only needed a couple. <coughs> On the Rules Committee, we have Russell Kelly, chairman, Brother Joe Davis, Brother Underwood, Doris Miller, Colonel Mester, Curtis Orman, R.L. Tucker. All of these people are members of our executive board and they were appointed in order they could meet and adopt the rules last night and have them ready for today. Sergeant at Arms, Chairman Herbert Williams, C.B. Turner, Charlie Horn, Joe Mullins, and L.D. Clark. Credentials Committee, James Jackson's Chairman, Mary Nell Whips, Hilda Hammock, Floyd Berry, Mildred Andrews, Mary Bryant, Joe Withrow, Billy Williams, and Mavis Rochelle, who was elected yesterday by the board to replace Diane Hawks of CWA who had resigned because she had left the employment of the Bell system. And we're going to write her a letter of appreciation for the job that she did for us. She was a wonderful person. So at this time, we'll ask Brother Jackson to give the credentials committee's report. Brother Jackson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Claude. So far this morning, the Credentials Committee has registered 73 delegates and 37 guests. Since 
with shortness of time, I would like to make a recommendation to the convention that these delegates be seated as registered because their credentials are in order. I would also like to include in that motion that we seat any other delegates who appear at this convention with the proper credentials. That way I don't have to make one report and the committee does move the delegates being seated. Thank you, Brother <coughs> Jackson. You've heard the motion, <coughs> which in effect means that all delegates have been registered and certified be seated. Do we have any discussion? Not all in favor of the motion indicated by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. We are now ready to do business. So at this time, I'll call on the chairman of the Rules Committee, Brother Russell Kelly, to present to you the rules, the rules of the convention. <laughs> at least the rules that uh, the committee proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Rules Committee met and adopted the following rules for this convention. Report of the Rules Committee. For the Mississippi AFL CIO Coach Convention, Primo's Northgate Convention Hall, Saturday, September the 16th, 1972. Rule number one the convention shall be called to order at 10 a.m. and will recess at 12 o'clock noon for lunch. The convention will reconvene at 1 p.m. and adjourn when all business has been transacted. Rule number two, every delegate desiring to speak on any subject shall proceed to the mic in his ear and be recognized by the chair, announce his name, organization he represents. Rule number three, a delegate shall not speak more than once on the same subject until all who wishes to speak have had an opportunity to do so no more than twice, no, long, no longer than five minutes at one time without the consent of the convention. Rule number four, any delegate to the Mississippi AFL CIO Coke Convention who, desi who disturbs the peace and dignity of this convention shall be barred from a seat or a vote in the der der deliberations of this convention Rule number five, a roll call vote shall be taken on the demand of 30% of the delegates. Rule number six, the Coke bylaws shall be the guide on all matters for which no provision is made herein. Rule number seven, the foregoing rule can only be changed by a two thirds vote of the delegates present and voting. Mr. Chairman, I so move. You've heard the motion to adopt the rules that we have in a discussion. If not, are you ready for the question? Mm -hmm. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Motion carried and so ordered. The next order of business will be the report of the executive board, and I'd like for you to find our second as treasurer and coach director who's supposed to give that report for the board, tell him we're ready for him. While we're waiting for him to get in here, apparently he, he didn't think we'd get this far this fast. <coughs> He's got a lot of things to do, you know. But let me tell you that the executive board met yesterday afternoon, most all afternoon, and among the things that we deliberated on was a report to this convention, <coughs> which will include our recommendations to the convention. We have agreed, <coughs> or at least we invited, the chairman of each congressional district committee to sit in on our deliberations and to be part of that decision. One of our chairmen was not able to be there, B.C. Smith from Moss Point. The vice president, Brother Russell Kelly, was there, who was also a member of our board. We agreed at the board meeting yesterday 
that when this report was presented to you, that we felt <coughs> that the chairman of each of the three congressional district committees should be allowed an opportunity to speak on the report. And we have a couple of other people that we've agreed to uh, give an opportunity to speak before we open the matter up to the floor for discussion by the delegates. So at this time, Mr. I'll call Mr. now. Mr. Stanley, long as it's on line seven, the phone out in the lobby. Mr. Who? Yeah, Deputy Old Stanley. Deputy Old Stanley. I think it'd be a good idea, Brother Deeds, if you'd ask him not to make those announcements over the loudspeaker to take on note of it, send it in here by the sergeant at arms. All right, at this time, Brother Knight will present our report. He'll read it to you. Uh, you got it, you passing it out? Yes, sir. All right, we're going to give a sergeant at arms a few minutes to get the report out to the delegates. We we'll want you to have it before you, <coughs> before Tom starts reading. We'll give him a few minutes on that. And uh, <coughs> while we're wait, waiting on the uh, sergeant at arms to pass out the report, uh, I want you to know that we have some plans for you that's not on the agenda. Uh, and I hope that door back there is still locked. If it's not, I want that door locked. Now what we plan to do when we recess for lunch, we've got two dining rooms back here that's already set up where we'll eat. We'll have a couple of tables reserved in one of the dining rooms where we're going to sit down with a couple of the congressional candidates and talk about some plans. Brother James Jackson, one of our vice presidents, and some other people will sit with the lieutenant governor in the other dining room a little further down. Now, you just, there's no, outside of this, there's no special arrangement. You, see, you sit where you can find a seat. But they're supposed to have enough places set up for every delegate at this convention. And I think you ought to know that that $4 restoration fee is paying for that lunch. Matter of fact, the meal was $3.95, I was told. So we're making a nickel out of it. And when we get through feeding our guests, we'll be going in the hole. Now, the reason for that, a couple of reasons for that, and that's simply this, that when we tried to find a place to meet, it would have cost us $300 to meet in this place. But if we were to have lunch in the building, then we could meet in this building free of charge. So knowing that we was going to have only one day of deliberation and trying to keep everybody together and trying to save money, we felt that this would be an ideal arrangement to have lunch in the same building, get a free meeting hall, you see, and all of these things. But the thing that you don't see on the agenda is about some of our plans to pass a bucket to raise some money at this convention. I tried to find some surf buckets this morning and couldn't find them. The best thing I could find was that little red thing up there in the, sitting on top of the piano, and I walked in with it this morning. The second day, I wanted to know what was I doing with that trash can. <laughs> that come out of the ladies' dress room at the state FLCO office. <laughs> that might encourage you to put a few more extra bucks in it. <laughs> the other one is a box that I found but we're going to have a sergeant at arms standing at each side of that door. And we and I, we, we're going to ask every delegate present to drop something in either that box or that can when they go out for lunch. Then we're going to ask the sergeant at arms to count that money. And we want to split it up three ways. When the candidates come in, if you endorse them this, this morning, then we want to present them with that collection that we've taken. Now, I realize that it would probably be best to wait till after Tom Knight wraps this thing up this afternoon to pass a hat. You see, we might get a few extra bucks. 
but the candidates uh, will be gone by that time, and we'll be in our business session of our plans and so <coughs> forth, and we're going to have to do it this way. So just keep in mind that there ain't but one door out of this place. You go to lunch, and that's that door right over there. And there's going to be somebody standing there either with that uh, Clark, Clark. with that bucket or with that box, one on each side, and we want you to drop something in it. And I'm going to start it off when we get started with a $10 contribution myself, and I hope that each one of you can give what you feel like you can give for this worthy cause. Right, Brother Knight, we're ready for you. You're not going to let me outdo you, so what you going to do, give 40? I borrowed $10. <laughs> See if everybody's got a copy of the report. Everybody got a copy of the report. Somebody over here don't have one. Hold up your hand if you don't have one. That's the best thing to do. These lights remind me of the lights we had where I was raised. Yeah, I can't you didn't have sleep. Them. You get as bad as me, I can't see. I'm not the only one that pays 29. <laughs> Everybody had it? Be best if you do. I can't read, you know, very well. Especially when you can't was a very important year to the people who reside in the United States and especially those who live and vote in the state of Mississippi. On November 7, 1972, the people of the, of the nation will decide who will be the next president and vice president of the United States. Many states will also be voting to elect senators to serve in the United States Senate, and each state will elect representatives to serve for the next two years in the United States House of Representatives. In Mississippi, one senatorial seat and three congressional seats are at stake in the November general election. This will give us a golden opportunity to elect three representatives to the Congress who will truly represent the interests of the great majority of Mississippians. The National AFL-CIO, through its executive council, has decided to make no endorsement in the presidential race. This action on the part of the Executive Council simply means that the Mississippi AFL-CIO cannot endorse a candidate for president because the organization is chartered <coughs> and operates under rules laid down by the parent body. Senator Eastland, who is currently holding one of Mississippi's senatorial seats as a Mississippi Democrat, is being challenged by a Republican candidate, Mr. Gil Carmichael of Meridian, and Mr. Prentice Walker of Mile. Mr. Walker is running as an independent and does not identify with either of the major political parties. Mr. Walker served a two-year term in the House of Representatives several years ago and was defeated six years ago by Senator Eastman when he ran against him in the Democratic primary. The executive board acting through its officers has checked the record of all three candidates and attempted to interview each of them by mail with a written questionnaire. Mr. Carmichael and Mr. Walker returned their questionnaire, but as of this date, we have not heard from Senator Easton. During the recent Democratic primaries, three friendly and qualified candidates were nominated to the vacant seats in the House of Representatives. These gentlemen were Mr. David Bowen in the 2nd Congressional District, State Senator Ellis Bodron in the 4th Congressional District, and State Senator Ben Stone in the 5th Congressional District. Each of these gentlemen are now faced by a Republican opponent in the November election. They are Mr. Carl Butler in the 2nd District, Mr. Thad Cochran in the 4th District, and Mr. Trent Lott in the 5th District. The state AFL-CIO established committees in each district to interview and check the records of each candidate. These committees have interviewed each Democratic candidate and have attempted to interview each Republican candidate. Mr. Butler and Mr. Cochran answered our questionnaires and have been interviewed. 
But Mr. Lott failed to return his questionnaire to the state AFL-CIO office, even though it was mailed to him by registered mail return receipt requested. It is also noted that neither of the three Republican candidates have ever held office and therefore have no public records to check. This convention is unable to endorse a candidate for president because of the rules of the national organization and the executive board can find no justification to endorse any candidate for the United States Senate. The committees in the second, fourth, and fifth congressional districts feel that we have three friends and three excellent candidates in the persons of Mr. David Bowen, Senator Bodron, and Senator Stone. Senator Bodron has served in the state legislature for a number of years with distinction and has an excellent voting record on legislation affecting the working people of our state. In 1960, Senator Bodron was one of seven senators to vote against our nefarious right to work law. Senator Stone is serving his second term in the state Senate and has also established an excellent voting record. While Mr. Bowen has never held political office, he has established a record of excellence while serving as state coordinator of state and federal programs in Mississippi for a period of four years. Mr. Bowen, Mr. Bodron, and Mr. Stone have sought and are now seeking the open support of organized labor in their bids to serve in the Congress. The executive board recommends that this convention go on record as follows. Number one, making no endorsement in the presidential race. Number two, making no endorsement in the senatorial race. Number three, that we endorse Mr. David Bowen for Congress in the second district, Senator Ellis Bodron for Congress in the fourth district, and Senator Ben Stone for Congress in the fifth district. Four, that the delegates in attendance at this convention pledge the full use of labor's organization, people power, equipment, and facilities in the all-out support of these three candidates until every voter has voted on election day and that we assist in every way possible to raise the necessary campaign funds. In making these recommendations, the executive board is mindful that independent candidates can qualify to run for either the Senate or House prior to September 28th. There have been rumors and a few news stories about other candidates who would qualify prior to this date. If this does happen, the executive board is of the opinion that these persons will not be serious candidates and that their entry into any of the contests would only serve the purpose of distracting a few voters. Time is of the essence in all three congressional races. If we had waited until after September 28th to hold this convention, it would have been virtually impossible to properly organize our forces for our friends. The executive board therefore strongly recommends that the delegates to this convention ignore candidates who qualify as independents at a late date and that we redouble our efforts to elect the candidates endorsed by this convention. Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of this report. Tonight has moved adoption of the report and has advised me that he would like to reserve his time for this afternoon session on the good and welfare and would not want to speak on the motion at this point. So we will therefore <coughs> call now upon the, the chairman of the second congressional district, Brother Marvin Taylor to speak on the report, Brother Taylor. Mr. Chairman, in support of the recommendation that has been presented, we'd like to make the following report from the Second Congressional District. Originally, we had a large committee that interviewed the candidates in the primaries. I, I think it'd be well to name these people uh, in order for you to understand why later we deviated somewhat from the original uh, action of procedure. <coughs> that committee uh, that met in line order consisted of E.M. Grantham, Greenville CLU, Obadiah Herndon, Greenwood, 
and Bonnie Bridges, uh, ACWA, Roscoe Cox, ACWA, Curtis Orman, West Point, Boilermakers, Rex Womack, Columbus, OCAW, Marvin Taylor, Cartons, Local 387, uh, Hugh Mitchell, I believe it is, IBEW, Cleveland, and uh, is it, it's either Dorothy or Dooley, Herndon, Greenwood, Dorothy Henderson, uh, Henderson uh, thank you. Donna Terry and Jimmy Henderson. <coughs> now, this is a written report, and we'll just read it as is, and it will be self-explanatory, I believe. It was suggested by Secretary Treasurer Tom Knight that a subcommittee be formed out of the full committee to interview and evaluate the candidacy of Carl Butler, Republican candidate for the second congressional district. This arrangement was thought to be less trouble and expense to the individual members of the regular committee and was agreeable to members polled and living in various areas of the second district. The following named served on this subcommittee. Curtis Orman, Ballermakers, West Point, Rex Woman, OCAW Columbus, Wayman Goodman, IUE, and President of Columbus Central Labor Union. In his absence, I believe Ann Smith sat in on this uh, interview and Marvin Taylor and myself with the Carpenters. An appointment was made with Mr. Butler for July the 7th at 8 o'clock p.m. at the Carpenters Hall in Columbus. Appearing with Mr. Butler were five of his advisors and supporters who desired to sit in the meeting which our committee agreed to. The committee had in hand Mr. Butler's response to a mail questionnaire from the Mississippi AFL-CI office which had been furnished by Secretary Knight. Additional questions were asked by various members of the committee, not covered in the questionnaire, resulting in a two and one half hours of discussion, pro and con, give and take. In the evaluation of Mr. Butler's candidacy, the subcommittee finds the following, and you will of course recognize the system uh, that we have used uh, with, uh, with all down through the years on this uh, four point deal, 16 point situation is 100%. And uh, we won't go into that. I'm sure that everybody understands the, uh, the point system. All right, here's what we found. In the evaluation of Mr. Butler's candidacy, the subcommittee finds the following in office, two points. Actually, Mr. Butler has not held office, but he's held some positions, and we, in lieu of office, we, you, we, uh, we gave that two points credit. Answers to questions, mail, three points. Chances of election, two points. Support, one point. Total points, eight. Since the full committee had previously interviewed and evaluated David Bowen before the primaries and, and he had received a score of 12 points, <coughs> your subcommittee <coughs> respectfully recommends that the Mississippi Coke Convention assemble endorse David Bowen for Congress of the Second District of Mississippi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Brother Taylor. We'll, we'll now call on Brother George Johnson, who is chairman of the 4th Congressional District Committee, to speak on the motion. Brother Johnson. We also set up a committee, subcommittee, after the committee we had in uh, Brookhaven. And on this committee was uh, Mary L. Wilkes, Robert Woodson, Emil Perry, and myself. We talked with uh, the uh, Thad Cochran. Uh, Mr. Cochran, uh, by the way, I hope you know, realize that he he is for 14 billion, in other words. He wouldn't want to repeal that. So that's one thing that really don't, uh, we didn't set too good with. But in the first place, we give him a total score of six. Since he hadn't held any previous office before, we didn't give him anything. And we didn't know anything about him other than he was an attorney. So we didn't figure, figure that give him any qualification. We give him two on each one of the other three, which give him a total score of six. And one thing that we have done in the, in the uh, general uh, uh, second primary, 
we had made a recommendation to the membership that we would support the Democratic nominee in the general election. Well, he hit us with that. When I first contacted him to make a contact with him, he asked me about that. I told him, I said, Mr. Cochran, we did not make the recommendation in that light. I said, we offer you, still offer you the opportunity. If you would like to talk with us, we'd be glad to talk with you. If you do not want to talk, that is perfectly all right with us. So he did want to talk. But uh, as I say, the committee itself recommended this uh, particular procedure which we went through that uh, you do endorse the candidate in which we have endorsed here. Thank you. Thank you, Brother John, uh, Johnson. We'll now call on Brother Russell Kelly, who is vice chairman of the 5th Congressional District Committee. Uh, yesterday when we met, uh, we were advised that B.C. Smith, the chairman of the committee, would probably not be able to get to the convention or to the board meeting due to a problem he had. Brother Smith did arrive late last night and is in the convention, but they have agreed in view of the fact that Brother Kelly set in on the decision-making process yesterday that he should speak here this morning in behalf of the report. And then when we opened the floor up for discussion by the delegates that Brother Smith and several other people probably want to speak on the motion at that time. So at this time, I'm going to call on Brother Russell Kelly. Thank you, Carl. Really, the reason I'm making this report, I know it won't take but a minute. Now, as you can see on page two of the executive board recommendation report, Trent Light is taking care of all the problems down in the 5th District. He didn't thank enough of this organization to even fill out his questionnaire and return it. So, uh, we didn't have any problems endorsing Ben Stone. As many of you know, Ben Stone has been a state senator for five years. He's got a, a good record as a state senator. He's, as I would call him, my kind of people. He's supported many bills that, uh, that we're supporting. And I think as a congressman, he'll continue to do so. And I think a good many of you met Ben outside while I go and talk to him. And without uh, too much, all I can say, I urge each and every one of you to support the executive board's recommendation and not only endorse these people, but go back into each district, county, and precinct and work for these people, get the vote out, because this will be the, the first and last time in our lifetime we'll get a chance to support three good congressmen at one time. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Kelly. Before I call on another next speaker, I would like to reminisce with you for just a minute. We have the unveiled present by the end of Mula Liston, who walked up to the end of Mula this morning. <laughs> like we finally wore the old gentleman out. He probably got tired of us running somebody against him trying to defeat him, just decided to retire and get, out, get us out of his hair. So at least we, we've got rid of Mr. Carver and we now have an opportunity to elect a good man. So at this time, with those remarks, I'm now going to call on Brother Bob Woodson, <coughs> who is, is, uh, <coughs> is in charge of minority affairs for the State Council Executive Board 
He is also chairman of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, which was recently organized in Mississippi. And for the benefit of those of you that don't know much about the A. Philip Randolph Institute, it's an organization made up of black trade unionists. And it's been endorsed by the state AFL's executive council. And we look upon this organization simply as being another arm of our organization to help us do a more pro effective political job. So at this time, I'm calling on Brother Bob Woodson for a few remarks. Brother Woodson. Thank you, Chairman Rouser. Uh, there's not a lot I can say about the report. I think it's uh, been debated on or uh, explained quite a bit here today, but I would like to refer to a couple of paragraphs in this report that contain that. Uh, I know there's been a lot of controversy throughout uh, this nation about the National Executive Council's position of neutrality on the presidential election. Now, I'm sure that most of us know that since the National Executive Council taking a neutrality position on the presidential election that the state organization has to follow the policy. Many of us uh, may wish as individuals to work for a particular presidential candidate, candidate well, if so, that's your prerogative. The state organization is not taking a position because of following the rules of the national party. Another article I would like to refer to, a paragraph I would like to refer to, is the second paragraph on page two where Brother Knight talked about, I read in the report, where there are opponents from other parties uh, who are challenging the Democratic nominees in the congressional district. Well, there are also a Republican who have qualified, who have qualified as an independent in the 4th Congressional District, which is the district I live in, who uh, the Democratic nominee is Senator Bojan. Well, we wonder whether or not the candidates who qualify at a late date are really serious or not. Uh, we wonder if they're really uh, trying to siphon away votes because of some animosity that, that exists in the state because of the position of labor as far as the presidential uh, election from a national level, and because of the fact that we have not uh, been able to uh, yield to the thoughts and manipulations of those few people that Carl talked about in his opening remarks. Uh, I think that uh, the time has come that uh, we have to look to a candidate as uh, to what he's really was or what his record has been in public office in the past. Uh, I myself have had a lot of experience over the state in the last few years uh, dealing with phonies like Carl talked about. And I find now that uh, what we are having to do is look at the issues realistically and support candidates who we think has the potential of doing the best job for the working people when they are elected. And in this instance, uh, the co previous COPE committees and interview committees have recommended that in the fourth district, we support the nominee who won the runoff primary in August. That candidate is Senator Ellis Bojan in this district. And of course, we've heard the report of, of committee chairmen from other districts. And I think that we should follow the recommendations of this report and support the candidates as endorsed by this convention. And we may be talking later on about some other issues involved in this election, but as, as, as the representative of A. Phil Randolph Institute, but as of now, I recommend that we adopt the report as uh, presented by the executive committee. Thank you. Brother Woodson for those timely remarks. Now we have a young lady uh, sitting at the podium up here who has been named by the State Executive Council as our lady in charge of women activities, Amy 
Hollowell of Water Valley, Mississippi. Uh, Amy will be <coughs> going on our payroll or working full time for the state organization starting Monday morning. We hope to get her into each of the three congressional districts uh, within the next few weeks to help get our ladies organized. What we frankly are gonna try to do in this election help of people like Bob Woodson and Amy Hollowell and the rest of you folks here sitting in this convention is we're going to get it all together and we intend to have three winners when we get two in November. So I've asked Amy to come up here this morning and have a few words to say to you. I don't expect her to make a lengthy speech, but I would like for her to have an opportunity to say a few words and for you to meet her and know who she is. Amy? all the help I can get and I would love to meet with all the officers of the central body and um, the, uh, the local union uh, and see what kind of program we can set up uh, to uh, win this campaign <coughs> and but just remember and no matter um, how hard we work to get these uh, in this campaign uh, uh, we would, we can't win if we don't go out and vote on November 7th. That will, that's one thing we've got to remember. We've got to get the vote out, uh, besides to get the message over to the people. So I will be looking forward to working with each of you in these three districts. Thank you, Amy. Now that you've heard the uh, speakers that we agreed to bring before you, Yesterday, the floor is now open for discussion by delegates from the floor. And I'd like to advise you that we have only one microphone that's available under the setup that we operate. In addition, not being able to see up here, we only have the one mic, and it's in the middle back here. And those of you that, wants, that want to speak, I would suggest when you get back there and get that mic that you hold it up and that you do not, uh, in other words, I'll make sure that the other thing attached to it stays attached to it because it is tied in with the recorder up here. So now the floor is open for discussion. Chair recognized Brother V.C. Smith, the chairman of the Fish con Fifth Congressional District Committee. He's going to come up here where he can make sure he can be heard. I'd say anybody else can do the same thing. Thank you, Claude. First, I would like to thank Russell Kelly, the vice chairman, for taking care of the business yesterday and apologize for not being at that meeting yesterday. But I'm not going to make apologies like Claude and Tom did about these lights. You know, age has a lot to do with that, and I'm going to admit mine. My baby daughter is expecting a baby any moment, so that was the reason that I went at that meeting yesterday afternoon. So I'll admit my age anyway. But anyway, I'll agree with Amy, and I'm certainly proud to see that she is going to be on the state council payroll and trying to get this vote out in November. I wholeheartedly agree and support the executive board report to this convention and would urge each of you to go back in your district and as Amy said, get the vote out. There's no question about who's got the money. We all know that. The Republican has got barrels of it, as Tom said. But money don't vote. 
We've got the votes if we can get our people out on in November in the election. We can elect these three gentlemen that we're talking about here, and as Tom and Claude and Russell has pointed out, this is the first time in my lifetime in the state of Mississippi, and I've been in Mississippi for about, I think, some 30, 30 years, that we've had an opportunity to elect three congressmen that will represent the people of the state of Mississippi. And I would just urge you to go back, and I'd urge you to adopt this executive committee's report. Go back, get the vote out, and we can win come November. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Smith. Anyone else like to speak on the motion? Praise Billy Williams. Brother Williams, I'm sure that you've got a word to say. You want to come up front? All right, Brother Billy Williams, the wheel horse in the 5th Congressional District, who probably needs no introduction. But I want to say before he gets up here that I spent considerable time in the 5th Congressional District, and I'm a little bit more familiar with some of the problems in that district than the other two. I went down and spent a lot of time with some of these people, and I want you to know uh, that if there's any single individual responsible for Ben Stone making it in that second primary, you're about to hear from that individual. I also want you to know, had it not been for <coughs> the work of uh, another group of people in that particular thing, Keep in mind that we only had a week and a half or two weeks to work in, uh, that we wouldn't have pulled it off. Now, I want to pay tribute now before Billy speaks to Bob Woodson and his group, people like John Jenkins of the Laborers and Pat Spigula, and some other people present at this convention for getting in there and getting the job done on getting the people out to the polls to vote. Ben Stone won this second primary by less than 3,000 votes. And the key to that election was in Jackson County as we had analyzed it. And it was won <coughs> in Jackson County of the work done by these people, plus the work done by Billy Williams and some other people present in this convention in the other areas of the <laughs> district. So, Billy, we happen to have you here, and we want you to have a word to say. I'd be disappointed if you wouldn't say something this morning. Thank you, Claude. I'd like to thank Russell for giving that report, too. BC and I were both uh, absent, uh, and you said it first. We got a pretty good race in the 5th District, and uh, I tried to get up here today, but I had a meeting last night. Of course, in the 5th District, uh, I can only speak on that one. Miss Holly, well, we got the finest group of ladies down there for you to work with us when you come down to think you other meet. We've got people in uh, Forest County where the telephone and ACWA locals that have gone all out for us. Now, these districts that uh, Claude said the race was won in Jackson County, that was the last county reported, and Harrison was next. But you people in Forest County and Jones County all the other counties up that way, all in both counts too. We just didn't take those counties. We came into this uh, race in the first primary, we had 14 counties in it. And Senator Caldwell came out on top in the second primary and he said it was one by less than 3,000 votes. I'd also like to add, they say Senator Caldwell had retired. He's retired from the Congress of the United States after this year, but he's in this political campaign. Don't fool yourself. Trent Lott is his candidate, and we know by that that we got a tough fight to, to make down there. But uh, we didn't earn it to begin with to lose it, and we're not going to lose it this late day. We've got still 12 counties, and I'd like to ask all of you here today if you have any relatives or friends that uh, you know in any of these counties, please write them and ask them to consider our candidate and consider the qualifications of the two counties. That's all they got to do. <laughs> this uh, county, Trent Lott, is 30 years old, has never held a job in his life. 
he was son's karma secretary. I always, uh, I believe in women live, but I don't believe in men taking secretarial jobs and working in the congressional job. And that's what you would have. <coughs> this fellow here got plenty of money, he got plenty of support. On the 19th of October, the uh, eminent Mr. Agnew is coming down. He's going to make an address down there. He's coming to Jackson to make an address, and I'm sure he'll go up to Mr. Butler's district and make an address. We also have some other reports from some other Republican congressmen that are coming down. Now, in Jackson County, I can't say enough about that bunch of fellas and ladies over there, and but this county, uh, all three counties are wonderful counties, I'm sure, but Senator Stone, of course, I'm partial to him. He's the first candidate that has ever come to us and asked us for our support. Before, when they asked you for your support, you played by their rules. But this time, we played by our rules. In any of these counties, and many of these counties, we have a person from organized labor, such as Brother Glenn, Glenn Canfield from Hattiesburg. He's a member of the CWA there. And uh, he's been asked for to serve and serve here in the second primary as the labor representative from Forest County. Brother Russell Kelly is one of the county campaign chairmen from his home county. We have people from Jackson <coughs> County that are serving in the summer from Patterson. And in this, we've got the candidate's word, and he's held up to it so far, that any time within any of those counties that those people that are appointed as labor chairmen their word is it. I mean, the county chairman, uh, he don't bypass them, he don't ignore them. It, it's none of, this, none, none, none of this going on. Any meeting is held, we're all there. Therefore, uh, to me, it's, it's very refreshing to meet a candidate like this. Usually they want the support, like uh, some of the people tell me in the fourth district, they was, well, it's Meridian up there. They want the support, but don't tell anybody. Down there, it's wide open, and it is uh, dried up the money, I'll guarantee you that. The money so it just drifted away, I mean, as it usually would. But uh, I'll just cut this short and tell you I thank you for letting me speak. And we appreciate your contributions in the trash can over here and your help in, in November and up until November. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Billy, for those timely remarks. Buddy, I tried to, in my remarks, uh, give credit to everybody that worked in the campaign, and I didn't intend to slight anybody. Uh, certainly the people in the other parts of the district uh, played a very important role, and I think people like Glenn Canfield especially should be commended and congratulated for the role that he played because after all he lived in uh, Forest County, the home county of the other candidate. And I'm sure that he took a lot of abuse and a lot of flack having uh, served in that capacity. So I don't uh, intend here this morning to slide anybody. Anyone else wishes the floor? Now I see a gentleman sitting down there holding his hands over his eyes who spent a lot of time in his fifth race and I know that he put in many long hours himself, and he's a former member of this executive board. And if he don't ask for the floor, I'm going to ask him to have a word to say. Brother D. Case, is there something wrong with you this morning? You don't feel like talking? Uh, well, I'll tell you, Claude, working at night and staying up at daytime is pretty hard on me, you know. But... <coughs> As uh, you said, and as Brother William said, we got us a real campaign going on down there. And our people in the labor movement has really got out and done good in the first and the second primary, and we're going to have a harder time in the third. And I'm appealing to them again to let's get out and get this thing over because we can't afford to lose Ben Stone. We need him up at Washington. No, thank you. Thank you, Brother Nikes. I knew I'd get you there one way or the other. Now, does anybody else want the floor to speak on the motion? About the other two districts who uh, 
well satisfied with the way things are going. We got we got some more business to talk about. about this convention ain't gonna be over when you adopt this report, I grant you that. There'll be much more said and some plans laid out before you about this whole situation before the day is over. But we did want to get the endorsements made, the report adopted before lunch. And I'm happy that we're moving a little bit ahead of schedule because we felt like we was going to have a lot of people wanting to do a lot of talking here this morning. Apparently we don't have, but I'm going to once more find out if there's anybody would like the floor before I put the motion. As a man moving up to the microphone, tell us who you are, where you're from. I'm Jim Stark from uh, GBBA Local 100 in Mineral Wells. In Mineral Wells. So tell us where Mineral Wells is. Oh, that's on 78 Highway, uh, just out of Memphis, Tennessee. Right in the edge of Memphis, line. Tennessee. I know on this report here, you uh, they hadn't made any recommendations. I see Senator Eastland down here, Gil Carmichael, and uh, Prentice Walker. I, I want I want to ask a question: Why they didn't make some kind of recommendation in this uh, uh, race? I know uh, Senator Eastland's not doing a good job for us. I've seen his voting record. I sent him a telegram. I sent Senator uh, Stennis's telegram, and I didn't receive any answer from Senator Eastland. I got one from Senator uh, Stennis. And if he's not doing his job, why didn't the committee recommend that we elect one of these other two people that's running against him and get him out of office and maybe one of these other ones will uh, have a better voting record than he does? Well, you raise a very interesting point, and I think it's timely, and I think that the chairman of uh, this organization should more or less give you the reasoning behind the fact that we're making no endorsement in this particular situation. I agree with what you said about Senator Eason. But the executive committee, <coughs> after reviewing the situation, and I must tell you that uh, we did personally interview Tom Knight and myself did, Mr. Gil Carmichael, who paid us a visit. And we talked to this gentleman quite at length. He is a very attractive man. Uh, and he did answer our question there. Uh, but in the course of our conversation with this gentleman, he voluntarily advised us <coughs> that he was for the right to work law. Now, I didn't ask him the question. He told us this uh, on his own. Uh, He's held no political office. He's got no record to check. <coughs> and had we endorsed Mr. Carmichael, uh, it would have meant that we would have had diverted much of our energies and money into this particular situation. And we didn't think Mr. Carmichael stood much of a chance of winning. Now, Mr. Prentice Walker, the independent candidate, uh, who many of you know of, uh, answered our questionnaire, and his philosophy and ideas about along the same lines. Now, when we endorse a candidate, we try to endorse a candidate that we can justify the endorsement of. And as uh, has already been mentioned here this morning, we have a certain way of uh, evaluating a candidate. We check the man's record in office. Uh, we check uh, <coughs> the group supporting him. Where is he getting his money from? In other words, uh, we, we also check or try to evaluate the possibilities of election, which is very important. And a number of other things that are taken into consideration. And we couldn't find any justification in evaluating these three candidates to endorse either Walker or, or Carmichael. And certainly there was no grounds to endorse Eastman. 
Now, I might mention this to you, that uh, in our thinking, in our evaluation, uh, it runs something like this, that Eastman would be a very difficult man to defeat. But were we to defeat Eastland, will Gil Carmichael, a Republican, relatively young, that we might then be stuck with another right to worker, a person that's anti-labor for 40 more years. And that Eastland can't last much longer, but he's getting up in years, and maybe when that gentleman's time comes to retire, or go to the resting place, or whatever you want to call it, maybe at that point in our state's history, we'll be able to find a gentleman that we can endorse and go all out for. That was the reasoning behind our recommendation to take no position in this particular race. Do we have anyone else that wants the floor or an explanation on any of the reports? I must say that I recognize uh, the fact that we have people here from the other two congressional districts. We appreciate your presence. We realize that the <coughs> business that's before you deals in only three congressional districts, but it doesn't mean that there's not anything that you can do to help. There is. There's much that you can do to help. You've got friends and relatives living in these other three districts, and there's one thing above all else that you can do, and I hope you'll do when you go back home, and that's to see how much money you can raise to help us finance the campaign. We need up a nickel we can get. Now, I'm talking now about you making contributions to the state FOL CIO out of your local union treasuries. I'm not talking about voluntary money to give the candidate. We can spend union treasury money, get this, and we've corresponded with you on this, we can spend union treasury money in our efforts to get the vote out as long as we can find it to our people. You know, that's what we can do. And I would strongly recommend, whether you live in one of these districts or not, that you immediately take this matter up with your local union when you get back home and see if you can't get a contribution made to our special legislative fund in order that we can put more people like Amy Hollowell on the payroll. And Bob Woodson needs some help to help get that vote out on election day. That's what you can do. Anyone else wish to vote? Are you ready to vote? motion is to adopt the report. All in favor of the motion to adopt the report signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. It shall be recorded that the motion was passed by unanimous vote and the candidates shall be so advised. Now we're running a little bit ahead of schedule for the morning session. Well, in any case, would you like to have the floor? Brother Claude, we, we had our CLU meeting last Thursday night. And you know, the Harrison County CLU believes in getting out and put out their own literature. Right. And, <coughs> and Dawson by the Harrison County CLU. Now, under this new fang tangle law we have about you can do this and do that with money, yeah. the question come up, could we put out our sample ballots? And at the bottom, you know, it's uh, endorsed by the Harrison County CLU and then Billy Williams signs it. Right. Can we put ads in the newspaper? and it be signed by the Harrison County CLU on, on the candidates that we endorse, paid out of the treasury of the Harrison County Central Labor Union. Uh, you're asking me a question now, and I uh, would prefer not to 
to answer that question in public. <laughs> I'd prefer to have a private conference with you and we'll be talking about some of our plans uh, uh, in this total area before the day is over. We intend to have a meeting with the candidates at lunch, Tom and myself, and the chairman of the district committees to talk about some campaign plans. And I'm not, I'm not going to try to give you a direct answer to that question, but I think there are some ways we can get some things worked out to help get the job done that you have in mind. Uh, I, uh, of course, uh, would not like to go to jail uh, during uh, the course of this campaign, and I'm sure that nobody else would uh, violate the uh, Reporting Disclosure Act. But there are ways and means that we can, I think, get things done along the lines you're talking about without finding ourselves in direct violation of the law. And we'll get into that with you uh, and with each congressional committee before the day is over, okay? Right. Any other person would like to follow? Now, <coughs> we have a few minutes before we uh, recess for lunch. We have a couple of things that uh, <coughs> we would like to talk to you about uh, before we get into the business session this afternoon that does not pertain to the election. Now, we have accomplished what we had hoped to accomplish prior to lunch already. Uh, as far as getting the uh, resolution passed and the candidates endorsed, because they're slated to be with us for lunch. The Lieutenant Governor, as you will note, will be our featured speaker and will also be with us for lunch. Uh, we'll hear from each one of the candidates uh, after lunch, and then after lunch, we want to get in and talk about some of the plans and some of the things that we propose to do to help you in each one of the three congressional districts. Now, yesterday we had our board meeting and we uh, had uh, quite a number of items of business on that agenda. Uh, Brother Knight is going to want to talk to you a few minutes about uh, the prescription drug program. Uh, he'll take only a few minutes, but before I bring him up here, I want you, I want to advise you that in that board meeting yesterday, uh, we had a gentleman uh, representing the dealers, or most of the dealers for Armstrong Tire Company, meet with our board, and after meeting with that gentleman, it appears that we will possibly be able to work out in the very near future a discount program for our members for automobile tires made in Mississippi by the Armstrong Tire Company. Gentlemen from Armstrong ought to be happy over this. Uh, we're very hopeful about this matter. And uh, the executive board have authorized Brother Knight and myself to, to negotiate this agreement out. And if we get it worked out, we'll have a meeting by executive committee. And we hope that in the very near future, that in addition to being able to use that identification card you got for the purchase of prescription drugs, that you'll also be able to use it and get a sizable discount for good automobile tires. Now, we have stressed to this gentleman one fact, and that is that these tires must be made in the United States, preferably in the state of Mississippi. Uh, we're not going to find ourselves sending our members down buying foreign-built tires. That's one of the things we stress to them. I thought you'd be interested in this bit of information. If we can get this program development as we visualize it, the members of this organization are affiliated with this organization that will have that identification card, will be able to save somewhere in the neighborhood of about $40 on a set of top flight 
automobile tires, first rate tires, and they'll get 25 to 35,000 miles on, and of course there'll be some cheaper grade that you can get also. But I thought that you especially would be interested in this, and I'm sure that Slim Hesler and Bob Fly and those people at that convention will be happy to know that we have uh, uh, had this meeting, and we, we are, look, it looks like we are in the process of making progress, and we will have a program in the very near future. Brother Knight, are you ready now? Brother Knight. With your permission, we'd like to take just a minute and discuss something with you that we intended to discuss at the regular convention. You recall March, but we ran out of time. We had more business on the agenda than we had done. So with your indulgence, just a minute, we'll talk about it now. <coughs> uh, by now, you should have a list of the drug stores in this state. They're presently on the contract with the Mississippi AFL-CIO for prescription drugs, vitamins, insulin, and the syringes, both fungal and disposable. Now, we have had, we do have now, and we will always have a few problems with this point. These people are just like management. When you turn your back, they're going to be up to their same we corrected a few of the problems we had, and we're going to correct the rest of them, but we're going to find out why. I'd like for you to look at this list. This is the first time we've had an opportunity to pass the complete list, and I don't think we've omitted any drugs out to a convention. Now, let me say this, <coughs> that I fear some of our members and some of the local unions are still not aware of just what can be purchased under this program. Now, as you know, the local unions are given the cost. This program is designed for the benefit of the locals affiliated with the Mississippi AFL-CIO. The locals are provided cards this should be a definite advantage to the local union. If you've got somebody working and don't want the local, then they're not supposed to get caught. And it's not a confounded thing that the law can do to you or about you when you tell them that if they want a card, they can join the union. And if the local union would say to get them, then they're going to have to affiliate with the city of CIO, and that's the only way they're going to get them. Now, <clears throat> we have heard reports, and again, nobody's criticizing anybody, but I'm simply saying this for your benefit because you're the leader. And we're asking your cooperation. We've had reports that some of our people have gone in some drug stores and they've attempted to buy cigarettes and beer and cigars and aspirins and a lot of other items, and then they have just literally come apart at the scene and were told that that wasn't covered in the program. And this is true. Again, let me repeat, and some of the local unions still have brochures which describe this program. Again, it's only prescription drugs, vitamins, insulin, and the syringe. Now, let me say this. You will notice on that list that we have contracts with the corner drug store and we have contracts with the discount drug store. <laughs> now, nobody's fooling anybody. If you have a card or your member has a card and they had previously, before we negotiate this arrangement, if they had previously traded at a Gibson pharmacy or some other discount drug store, then they go back with this card. They may not say as much. They may not say anything on some drug. Now, this contract provides that the cost, which is listed on the brochure, refers then to a certain professional fee in addition to that cost. But that cost shall be based on the druggist red book of cost. This is known as the druggist buy. 
Now there's two salts, and it depends, that salt depends on the drug. Some drugs, we're told, which are common, which doctors prescribe more than others, they buy them in unusually large lots, car loads for the truck loads with some, and of course the price is still lower. And this is where their selling price, their cost plus the professional fee that we have may be about the same thing as they were already selling it for. Now if it's something that doesn't move as fast, the quantity in which they buy it is not as large, the cost is more, and of course then in that case our members will realize more things. But those people that have been trading at the corner drugstore before they got the card, and now they're, they're the ones that will be able to tell the difference. Now very shortly we're going to surprise all of these people, and I hope that this is an executive session. The doors are locked, and if there's somebody in here that's not supposed to be, then I can think of about five or six sergeants in arms, but I think we won't talk to you. <laughs> but we're going to shortly have someone call on these drug stores, and they're going to bring a letter on the floor and that they represent the Mississippi AS, ASCIO, and that person is going to be in town. And we're going to see who's cured and not cured. I don't think we have to say but one did. Because the contract said that we have the right to check their records. Now over in Alabama recently their auditor called on one drug store and they said no thank you, you don't check my records. And just called the state of the FLCI office and said, well, we don't need it. So they canceled the contract. So we're going to check the, the pharmacy that we have contract with and just as soon as we can get that person that has the necessary know-how of him and goes in there and looks at the books to tell who's doing what to do. So I can tell you that we, we know we've got problems. We're going to straighten them out. And this program is intended to be one thing get the items mentioned in that contract for our affiliated membership just as cheap as we can possibly get. Now that's what it's all about. We did have one situation recently that kind of got mixed and then it got mixed with some people that was in Florida. <coughs> we negotiated a contract up there with a couple of guys. I think it was Mark people in the area, as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, Duke conferred with the leadership in the area, and uh, the president was thinking about it, but he followed up, invited me to go to the guy and he said, I went up, sit down with him and talk with him, he was very easy to work with, so told us he would keep the contract and think about it a few days, a few days later call him and advise me that he was going to sign it, but there was one problem that he didn't have the drugstore built. Well, now he had a drugstore in Florida, but for some reason he didn't want the program to apply to that particular thing. I told Brother Caldwell, I said, this is up to you folks in the area now. You know the people, if you want to wait on this guy, put this store up, and that's all right with me. So we wait. This drugstore was put up and it was ready to open about August 1st. We did all of our letters and brochures. And on Thursday, August 10th, if I remember, and I don't think I'll ever forget, on page 11 of the Daily Surrender, there was a neat little sign. Still there. It says, please note. It says, it's been called to our attention, or the rumors are, or something, something like that, that this drugstore is on the way in. Please be advised that it's not. It's a partnership between you and the name that you know. It is true that we've agreed to uh, sell prescription drugs to unions at a set price, but we'd like to advise you that those prices are available to everybody. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> I'll swear, you know, I, I've been mad a few times, but I lit up like a Christmas tree. 
Mr. Norris Miller called out all the office, the president of the ground. Again, I wasn't in it. But anyway, we had a few conversations on the phone with different people, and everybody I talked to, I asked them to send us a copy of the ad, and we had three or four ads, and every time I seen one, I got mad. And so I advised those gentlemen by registered mail that up on the receipt of fame, that contract was canceled in as much as with that ad they, they violated it from A to Z. Send it to them registered mail, and I have a receipt for it and sign. One of the parties will sign for that. We advised our local men. And I told them, and I sent a copy of this letter to Brother Miller Bobby Foley. I told them that we have dealt with a number of people in Mississippi, but no time in the past have we encountered such a deal. And I would have said it differently, but I'd be in jail for obscene language in the mail. Because I literally wanted to go up there and tear him apart limb from limb. So I'm told that they're not doing too good. And I hope that the good people in that area will see that he improves until he does work. <laughs> that is, that is the most uh, outrageous thing we've had happen, you know. Well, he can just have the public. I don't think he's got a credit for it, you know. But we will have a drug program in part of it that we take to all the rest of my CJ has as I promise you that. And I don't think the next guy is going to cancel a contract. It simply boils down to this, and uh, Bobby, if I'm wrong, tell me, he just admitted. I think Bobby talked to him pretty rough with some of the other people. He admitted he didn't have the gall and the guts to stand up to a few of his competitors. Well, I've had others that we have contracts with that tell us they've been called on and been had threatened and this, that, and the other, and they simply told them that that store was their product and their business, and if they want to do business with me, then I'll turn on the head of their business and get them out. So that's the way he should have done, but he didn't have guts enough to do that, so now we'll just let him hang and speak. Now, <clears throat> beginning shortly, all the local men that are affiliated in Tyler will receive a new drug different color. The one now is white with blue letters. The new one will be green with black letters. Different color all the way. As of midnight, December 31st, the old card will be on no more list. All druggers will be advised they will be sent a sample of those cards. And we ask the local unions here to please see that the members get those cards before January 1st, 1970. Others will not be good. Now let me say one other thing. Now we're still ahead of time, but I got the call for a little extra. I doubt that. Um, there's one other thing that bothers me, and you folks will have to help us with this problem. You know, when we sign an agreement with an employer, we are both bound to obey and honor that contract. Those of you that have been uh, shocked to local union officers, those of you that are business owners, you know how you feel when you have to take up a grievance and you know that your contract has been violated, you know you like the guy that was invited to ride the airplane a many years ago. He says, I'll go with you, but what am I going to stand at Francis to go with him? You just haven't gotten to where to stand in certain cases, you know? Now here's the situation. This drug contract plainly states that in order for a person to receive the prices indicated that upon making that purchase, that card shall be exhibited. Now you know what we've got happen. This is human nature. But I want you to help us. See how people walking in these drug stores and they have a prescription of the drug. They don't produce that card until that drug and the retail price has been inserted and then it's passed out to the clerk and then all hell breaks loose. Now the drug stores don't have to honor this card. That's just how simple it is. If this happens, it absolutely states that they will be advised that that is an AFL-CIO prescription. So this is going on. Now I know everybody's easy to know if they're saving three cents a nickel, a dime, or 15 cents, or whatever. 
But we are, my friends, violating the contract in some way. And if they refuse, then they've got contracts with them to refuse to honor the card on those conditions. So we continue to help us in other ways. And we're going to keep on trying. We're going to try. We've got a few other areas. I think we'll have a drug store in Columbia now shortly, and Anna will have a contract with them, Hattiesburg and Kettle. We're putting up one in Columbia. don't run off in Gulfport uh, we thank you for the service but how about putting a drugstore in Gulfport and one in Biloxi our uh, transportation means makes the drugs too high for the men to go out to the drugstore Brother Sal man, I appreciate the fact you mentioned that and I have already complained to the senior vice president of that company that we would like another store in that area. And he told me he would look into it and see what he could do. So I am aware and I can appreciate the problem having been down there. I know what you're talking about. I think the Gu Gibson store in Gulfport will put it in, but I don't know anything about one in, in uh, Gulf in Biloxi, but I understand Gibson's going to build a big store yeah, in Biloxi. Right. But I, I am aware of the problem, and I have talked to the head man and asked him if he would consider trying to put in at least one other store to make it a little more convenient in the area.
join me if you'd like to go right in. I'm sure you'll want to stretch a little bit, maybe go to the restroom or something. But uh, I, I, I would like to ask you to get back here promptly at 1 o'clock because the lieutenant governor will be here. The regular keynote address will have all three congressional candidates that will be speaking. And after that, we're going to have some other things we want to talk to you about, some plans about the election, et cetera. So I'm now I'm asking the sergeant and arms if they're ready with the bucket. Your bucket ready? Sergeant at arms, that gets into the hall. And uh, those delegates in the hall, please be seated. I got an important announcement to make, at least I think it's important, before we bring on and introduce our distinguished speaker. I'm happy to announce that the sergeant at arms, uh, through their efforts of persuasion, uh, collected $120 apiece for each of the congressional candidates when they left here a while ago. So before I bring on the next speaker, I'd like to get rid of this stuff. It's heavy. I've been carrying it around. I'm going to give Senator Bodron his package of $120, Senator. Thank you. I'm glad to have it. It's not too heavy for me to carry, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Boyd. Uh, gentlemen, that's uh, uh, just a little token of uh, appreciation. We felt like we ought to take up the collection before our delegates went out for lunch, and we insisted they make a contribution. And uh, I couldn't find anything else to couldn't find a syrup bucket or anything like that, so I had to buy the the uh, wastebasket out of the girls' restroom in my office to bring down here. And uh, then a box. Everybody wanted to put the money in the wastebasket the basket for some reason. I don't know why. But anyhow, we do appreciate that uh, contribution from each one of you. I'm sure the, the three candidates can find good use for it. And of course, uh, I want all three of them to know that uh, we intend to raise much more than $120 for you campaign. Now, at this time, <coughs> it gives me a great deal of pleasure <coughs> to present to you our next speaker. Uh, this gentleman should need no introduction to this group. Uh, he's been before you before. He's been a public official for many, many years in various capacities. I consider him uh, as a personal friend myself. I've been doing him that long. I've been in his home. I know his wife. I've had dinner with him and things of this kind. 
I look upon him as being one of, as one of our state's most distinguished public officials, and uh, I had hoped that if he would have been governor of Mississippi by this time, but uh, some people around the state felt otherwise here a few years ago. But at least they did see fit to elect him as our lieutenant governor in the last election. And since that time, he's done an excellent job as your lieutenant governor. It's been my pleasure to have worked with him uh, during the past uh, session. And I can tell you that he's been doing an excellent job in your behalf. I don't know what his future plans are, but I still hope he uh, has hopes to uh, the governor of the state one day, and I hope that when that time arrives, they do have that place fixed up over there whereby he can move into it, uh, governor, go bathroom and all. <laughs> and so with those remarks, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you our Lieutenant Governor William Munn. Governor Munn. <laughs> Mississippi this year finds itself with the opportunity of electing three new members of the National House of Representatives. So far as I know, uh, certainly within our lifetime, this has not happened. We have been socked into a situation where year after year, term after term, with an occasional election here and there, of almost automatically sending the same congressman back to Washington. The times have changed changed in many respects. But they have changed for the better as far as I'm concerned this year in terms of the <laughs> in terms of the purposes for which we met here today. I think it's a refreshing breath that we have the chance to take here this year selecting uh, these three districts represented by these nominees from a very large and very able slate of candidates for the Democratic nomination. These three men who now sit before you and come before you here today and before the electorate of their respective districts in November. I have come here today, uh, and I hope not presumptuously. Last thing I have on, on my mind is to try to tell anybody how to vote. As a matter of fact, I, I cannot claim today to be a constituent, uh, a prospective constituent of, of any of these nominees since my, my voting residence uh, remains my native county of Grenada up in the second district. And as I say, I'm not trying to tell anybody how to vote. Most of you are aware that the limits of, uh, of 
our influence, uh, we men, uh, is uh, probably doesn't extend to telling our wives how to vote. So I'm not here in that role today. I simply have come at your very generous invitation to make some observations that I think are valid and relevant about the choice that you have the opportunity to make and, and with the strength of, of your organization and the, and the organizations represented here, that you have the substantial influence to bring to bear on the result of these elections. Let me couch it in general terms, first of all. There are those, of course, who ask the question, what's the difference? Uh, whether we have a Republican or a Democrat in the, in the Congress. Well, insofar as Mississippi is concerned, I believe and I have believed for a good while. Mm -hmm. I believe that it is in our best interest, our economic best interest, our political best interest, to have to retain a Democratic Congress during the next administration, regardless of who the President of the United States may be. that for two reasons. One, from the national standpoint, I believe that the programs <coughs> uh, that have been fostered and enacted into law by Democratic Congresses have been in the national, by and large, have been in the national interest. From a sectional standpoint, those of us who remember how things were, and I do remember as a boy growing up on a hill farm up in Grenada County during the 1930s, we owe, we owe much of the present economic prosperity that most of us are enjoying now programs enacted by Democratic Congresses during that period since the 30s. The land, speaking from a farm standpoint, the land. The land has become more productive in this state as a result of Democratic Congressional programs that have been enacted down through the years. The ability of the working man and woman in this state and in this country to claim a more decent share of the national income, to get high wages for work done has been largely the result of programs enacted by Democratic Congress. This has been an economic have-not area of the country, as we all know. And it has been through democratic congressional leadership, much of it coming through committees that have been headed and led by Southern Democratic congressmen. Many of these programs have come to pass. And as you run down the list, right now in the Congress, as you run down the list of the, of the leadership in the Democratic caucuses on each end of the count, you still find, regardless of who's sitting in the White House down there on Pennsylvania Avenue, you still find most of the real hard, tough decisions 
really being made by the Democratic leadership on each end of the county. Much of that leadership comes from this part of the country. This isn't to say that we always get what we want out of Democratic Congress. But I am constrained to believe that we will have a more sympathetic ear there in Washington if we maintain majorities in the Congress during the next administration. And that is the objective that I think we need to keep our eyes on here in Mississippi this fall. Chairmanship of many, perhaps most of the Congressional Committee will continue to be in the hands of Democrats from this area of the country. From Mississippi, from Louisiana, from Arkansas, from Texas, from Alabama, from Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, Virginia, every southern state I believe, every southern state, every deep south state is represented now in one house or the other with one or more major committee chairmen. And in the House of Representatives, we have a very able congressman just across the line in the state of Louisiana, Hale Boggs, Majority Leader. This is the kind of leadership that I think we cannot turn out. Now so much for the national and sectional reasons for retaining a democratic Congress. Let me talk about the three nominees that are here before you today. I have known all of them a good many years. I have had the privilege within the, the last few months of serving in the Mississippi State Senate as the presiding officer of that body with two of these nominees. And I have worked with the other one when he was a very valued member of state government for a number of years. In no certain order, except in the order of the period of time for which I have known these men, let me say one or two things about each of them individually. Sitting to my immediate left here is the nominee for the House of Representatives from this district. I have known Ellis Bodron for exactly, I believe, exactly 30 years. It was just 30 years ago this month that I knew him when he and I were underclassmen up at the University of Mississippi. No student ever went through that institution with a more distinguished academic performance than did Ellis Bodron, demonstrating there in his student days the qualities of leadership that automatically stamped him for leadership later on. He and I started out together in legislature in 1948. He was a leader from the very first day that he walked into the chamber of the House of Representatives. 
and he has climaxed a very distinguished legislative career by having served for the last several years and more recently this year by my own appointment as chairman of the Finance Committee of the State Senate, which, which is probably the strongest and most influential committee in the entire legislative structure of the state of Mississippi. Ellis Bodron has demonstrated <coughs> over a very distinguished, distinguished public career that he has the equipment to know how, the ability to get along with people that will make him a very, very valuable member of the House of Representatives from this district. I have known Ben Stone since he was a law student at Ole Miss back in the middle 50s and have followed his career since that time as a very able lawyer and as a member of the state senate for the last five years. I have said this about Ben Stone privately to friends of mine that I felt <coughs> that of all of the relatively younger, newer members of the state senate, that Ben Stone stood out <coughs> above them all in terms of his effectiveness in getting things done on the floor of that body. He's been a tireless worker. He served very, very ably on some of the major committees, being the chairman of one of those committees and he has, a, he has a feel, a real feel, for the needs of the people of this state. He's representing, he will be representing a district that is rapidly increasing in population, in industrialization, that will continue to increase. The problems of that sort of a, of a district will absolutely demand man with the, the competence and the drive and the motivation of Ben Stone. The third nominee, and as I say, I mentioned David Bowen, third only because my acquaintance with him does not extend back quite as far as does my acquaintance with Senators Bodron and Stone. But I have known him, too, for some 12 or 15 years. Again, in a career that has brought him a great deal of distinction in, in many areas. As a teacher, as a teacher here in this state, as one who has worked in the field of attempting to do, do something about eliminating the ravages of poverty in Mississippi. The man who for, for four years at the state level helped put together the program that saw for the first time Mississippi beginning, beginning to get its share of the federal, federal dollar no telling how much money has come into Mississippi, resulting in improving the way of life of many, many people as a result of the resourcefulness and work and effort of David Bowman. He knows his way around Washington, D.C. because he has worked there. And he knows his way around the state of Mississippi because he is one of us. He too, I think, on the basis of my knowledge of, of what he stands for, represents this, this progressive point of view that we need to have. 
the members of the House, members of the Congress, representing us in the greatest lawmaking body in the world. So here we have them, ladies and gentlemen, three candidates for whom we don't have to apologize to anybody who can stand before you on their, on their own merits as individuals, but who also stand as the flag bearers of the Democratic Party. And I hope, and I believe you will, I believe you will see to it that these men have a chance to represent us in the House of Representatives come January. Let me just run, run up one thing of caution. I said at the beginning, this is a unique year. This is an unusual year in Mississippi politics. And you know this as well as I do, that this is not going to be any runaway in November. It's going to take some real hard work. And as a candidate for office myself from time to time, I know that these men can't do it by themselves. They need all the help they can get. I'm looking at, at an organization here and representatives of local organizations here in this state that have the capacity get the kind of vote out that will ensure that in November we elect Ellis Bodron, David Bowen, and Ben Stone to the Congress of the United States. Thank you very much. Discussion during the lunch hour with the candidates, and we had a problem about which candidate should be introduced and speak first. <coughs> and they left it up to me. I said, Well, now we can do it several different ways. We can go by alphabetical order, we can draw straws, we can flip coins, or we can start with the second district and come down to the fourth and then the fifth. So in final analysis, we decided that we'd start with the second district and work our way down to the fifth, which means that David Bowen will be the first man to speak to you. Then Senator Bodon will be next, and Senator Stone will act as a cleanup man in this situation. <laughs> so if uh, something said, Senator Stone, it does not meet your approval, by these other two gentlemen, <coughs> then you shall have an opportunity to let them know about it, okay? So at this time, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you the candidates that you have endorsed for Congress from the second congressional district, Mr. David Bowen. Mr. Bowen. <laughs> Let me express my deep appreciation to you all for the outstanding work you put in on my behalf back during the primaries. Led to a resounding 57% victory over a man that most of you have described as an anti-labor candidate. And I'm certainly looking forward to that same kind of support in the general election for a victory over the Republicans. 
and I certainly want to say also that I am grateful to all of you from throughout the state, whether or not you are from the 2nd Congressional District or not, because we're all comrades in arms in a great crusade to win this victory on November 7th. <laughs> Since I have not held elective office before, and my two colleagues here have, perhaps I might take just a few moments to tell you a little bit more about me and my background so that you can get to know me, so that you might be able to deal effectively with those you might encounter on the campaign trail. Uh, as Governor Winter told you, I spent several years of my life teaching political science and history at the college level here at uh, Millsaps College and Mississippi College. I worked in Washington for the Office of Economic Opportunity and uh, if you'll pardon my saying so, for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, though I did work on the field of educational legislation for that body. It did give me an opportunity to spend a good deal of time testifying before congressional committees, preparing testimony, drafting legislation, working with staff members and members of Congress in Washington. I returned to Mississippi four years ago and took up the position as federal state coordinator for Mississippi. I think it was a position that we had needed for some while. And I had an opportunity during that time to initiate several major programs that I believe have been accepted as being of some decided value to this state. One of them was the Appalachian Program, which is responsible for the construction of sewer and water systems, and roads, and hospitals, libraries, airports, <coughs> for vocational technical training programs, and a variety of other programs to develop the resources of the northeastern part of Mississippi. I organized the Law Enforcement Assistance Program, which has placed funds into local police and sheriff's departments, into the Attorney General's office, into the Highway Patrol, and the various law enforcement activities for narcotics control, organized crime control, and a variety of other investments in the field of law enforcement in the state of Mississippi. I organized the state's Highway Safety Program, which has invested monies in helicopter ambulances, circus ambulances, emergency radio equipment, driver training, and a whole range of programs to help increase safety on the roads of our state. I established the State Council on Aging, which has set up training programs for older Americans, nutrition programs, social, recreational, educational programs throughout Mississippi for our senior citizens. I set up the State Comprehensive Health Planning Division, which was responsible for drafting the plans for Mississippi's Medicaid program. I think this is a program that has received acclaim throughout the country, and I think that my keen interest in comprehensive health planning and medical care programs inclined me very heavily toward a commitment to work toward the development of good, sound, national health insurance program for America. I also had an opportunity to organize a statewide system of planning and development districts. These districts are there to help coordinate federal and state and local investments in a whole wide range of areas. These have been well received, they've been popular with local officials, and I think they have helped cut out the waste and overlapping duplication in a lot of our public programming. One of the uh, examples of the kind of review work that these regional bodies and our office at the state level did as a clearinghouse for federal programs was to review things such as the environmental impact statements for major projects. The 10 Tom Waterway is an example, a project which I think will mean a great deal economically to our state in terms of job creation and the development of our economy. That environmental impact statement went through our office initially. We reviewed it, approved it, and it fed it along its way. And unfortunately later it was waylaid by court action, but I'm happy to see that the 10 time is now on the way. Another important program that I had an opportunity to establish was the State Manpower Training Division, which was responsible for the funds for on-the-job training uh, through many industries in our state, not only upgrading skills of those already employed, but also training those who did not have the skills to be employable. And I served as the chairman of the State Manpower Planning Council, which spent some 100 or reviewed the expenditure of some 
170 million dollars a year for many forms of vocational and manpower training throughout the state. I'd have to say at this point that I think partly my experience there and working with those vocational training programs and also I think as a part of my fundamental conviction as I look at our society and our economy led me to feel that we need a major new emphasis upon vocational technical training in our society. Now, I have spent a good many years of my life teaching liberal arts subjects at the college level and I think there's a very important place for these things in our society. But I think that as a nation, we have perhaps placed a little bit too much emphasis upon that kind of education and we need to place a great deal more emphasis and a great deal more investment in dollars in the area of training people to work with their hands, training people for the real world of work. I think this is what we need. We need to generate a greater degree of respect for the value and the importance of labor in American society. These programs and others that I had an opportunity to work with, such as initiating the Occupational Safety and Health Act here in the state of Mississippi, have given me an opportunity to work with a wide range of federal and state agencies, give me a kind of familiarity that I think would be of great value <coughs> to you as a member of Congress. I think most of you know that a member of Congress, certainly a member of the House particularly, must spend a great deal of his time working with federal agencies in an attempt to resolve problems and obtain assistance for you from those agencies. You know, my, my opponent, the Republican, is fond of saying that uh, as a Republican he can walk in the front door of the White House and talk to the President. Well, you know, the President's way on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, and he really doesn't have time to go pulling irons out of the fire for freshman congressmen. And this is true whether or not the President's a Democrat or a Republican. I've seen both of them work up there. And they're mighty busy. They have an opportunity to meet with a few occasional committee chairmen to resolve major problems of state. But they really don't have time to wet their freshman congressmen. If you're in Congress, you have to look for help to the members of your delegation and your party on Capitol Hill. And even with a Republican president, it is not my observation that the federal agencies are much more responsive to the Congress in matters of this kind than to the White House. Because after all, that's where their bread is buttered. Their appropriations and their enabling legislation come from Congress. And whoever's the president for the next four years, uh, they've got to look to Capitol Hill for, for the appropriations to keep them going. So even under a Republican president, I find that federal agencies are extremely responsive to the requests of Democratic congressmen. And uh, I think this is a matter of, of, of a special importance, particularly when we consider the fact <coughs> that we have a majority Democratic control in the Congress, have a 77 vote margin in the House and a 10 vote margin in the Senate. And most observers expect this to continue. In the last 40 years, there have been only four years in which the Republicans have controlled Congress, and not in the last 18 years. And as I say, I think you may well expect to see continued Democratic control in the House of Representatives and almost certain continued control in the Senate. <coughs> so it's of great value, I think, to the people of Mississippi to be represented in the majority party. If you happen to be in the majority party and if you happen to be fortunate enough to be the member of a state delegation which has very powerful and very, very influential members of Congress, as we do here in Mississippi, and very powerful and influential neighbors, as we do here in the South, then you are in a position to be of great service indeed to your constituents. And I believe that all three of us find ourselves in that position. The legislation which is handled by Congress, I don't have to tell you, is determined in large part, the future fate of it is determined by chairmanships. Three quarters of the major committee chairmanships of Congress are in the hands of Southern Democrats, as Governor Winter has told you. In the House alone, there are 11 major committees, eight of them are headed by Southern Democrats with the retirement of one of these chairmen this year. Seven out of the 11 will be headed by Southern Democrats. This is a matter of a real importance to all of us. Because I have really, quite frankly, observed in Congress over the years that the real decisions are based not so much upon Republican, Democratic, or even liberal conservative lines is quite oftentimes upon regional lines. It's who's got the power, who controls the committee and the subcommittee, and who's going to serve the interests of his area. 
So I have found that this is one of the most effective arguments that you can use in defending the candidacy of a Democrat for Congress. Now, as I say, our Republican opponents are inclined to say sometimes, well, President Nixon is going to be reelected, so let's just, uh, let's just give him a Republican Congress. Well, you know, President Nixon has just what he needs. He's got a Democratic Congress controlled by Southern Democrats. And we in the South form sometimes a kind of third force, almost like a third party occasionally, but it does enable us to wield a great deal of influence in Congress. We're able to work very closely and very effectively with national Democrats and at the same time to work closely with Republicans when we need to and to work with the White House under any kind of administration. I had an opportunity recently to visit Washington with many of our national leaders in Congress, as did my colleagues here, who will be speaking to you shortly. And in case, case a question has come to your mind, and I know that my opponent in this race has raised it on several occasions, and I know you may have to answer that question. The question of whether or not it is necessary for me to endorse the Democratic candidate for Congress this year, as a result of my conversations with national leaders of the party, I concluded quite certainly that I was under no obligation to endorse and support the nominee of the party. It's not to say that you should not or that he's not an outstanding man. I'm simply saying to you that that is the official national position. My position stated publicly is that I'm not taking a, a role and an intervention in the presidential race. As I've said on several occasions, I'm not running for president, I'm just running for Congress. And I believe the people of this state can make a decision as to who they'd like to support for president well enough without my advice. But there is a matter that I think all of you should bear in mind on this whole subject of presidential politics and, and congressional politics. Just remember that, that the Congress and the White House are two wholly separate bodies and that whatever a Democratic or Republican convention may do, those actions are not binding upon Congress. Whatever resolutions or actions the Democratic Convention might have taken in Miami Beach this year are certainly not binding upon the Congress. And Congress has asserted its independence in, in, in many ways. As an example, the Democratic Caucus of the House this year met and voted by more than two to one vote to reject the reform rules of the Democratic Convention. And I think quite honestly, there are a number of Democratic leaders in Congress who are not altogether pleased with the events of that particular convention. Be that as it may, I simply mention that to point out to you that there, one of the great strengths of the Democratic Party is that it allows a great deal of freedom to its members. Those of us who are elected from this state to go to Congress as Mississippi Democrats are free to vote our convictions and conscience there. We're under no obligation to uh, endorse or support anybody's program, platform, or philosophy. Congress is sometimes almost a coalition or a confederation of members from the various states. And I think that's been in our interest. And uh, regardless of what a presidential nominee may be, may be obligated to do in terms of his, his candidacy, I can say quite certainly this, that this year, uh, throughout the country, there will be a major emphasis placed upon the importance of electing Democrats to Congress, of allowing those Democratic nominees the maximum degree of freedom possible, and then certainly not imposing any kind of sanctions upon them once they are elected to Congress. As I was told on several occasions, we simply want you to get elected and come up here and vote to organize the House on the third day of January. And I think that is the course of action which we'll have to take this year. In terms of your own relationship with those of you, your colleagues and friends, those you make contact along the campaign trail, it is especially important, in my honest opinion, this year to emphasize the possibility of splitting the ticket. Of course, that means simply that you may vote for whomever you wish for president, whether it be the Democratic nominee, the Republican nominee, or a right-hand candidate, or your next-door neighbor, or whomever you wish, or leave that slot alone altogether, if you wish. And then you may vote for anybody you wish, hopefully for the Mississippi Democratic nominee for Congress uh, for the remainder of the ticket. We are all standing together. We are supporting each other. And I think it would be in our interest if we can support these candidacies for Congress this year. 
Republicans, I like to advise you, are resorting to tactics which I think are sometimes unfortunate, but uh, perhaps not surprising. And I think you may we may encounter all sorts of name calling and rash statements on the part of Republican candidates. Uh, I know uh, that's been true in my particular district. They have. Uh, they have even gone so far as to remove papers from federal agencies, which they're attempting to use uh, in this campaign. Uh, and it's been an illustration of just what sort of a rash and far-fetched kind of action one of these fellows would do. They even pilfered some papers out of the State Department to determining that I had traveled around in Europe in this country and that when I was studying over there as a student presumably assuming that by indicating that I might have traveled in uh, one country or another that they didn't approve of, perhaps perhaps they, uh, some of the communist countries of Europe, that, uh, that this, this was something they felt they might use adversely in terms of my campaign. Well, these little sort of <laughs> Republican smut squads as they are were sort of traveling about the district and I think you may encounter this kind of a tactic on the part of those who feel they are in a in a disadvantageous position. I will advise you that my personal attitude to the campaign is I intend to spend my time talking about my own candidacy, my qualifications, what I feel I have to offer to you and to the people of this state. I don't personally intend to speak to answering the kind of uh, charges that, that many of them concoct. And I think that's the kind of campaign we'd like for you to run. You know, I think in, in closing, I'd like to just remind you of uh, one or two things about what's going on this year. We are faced, I think, with a major attack on the whole labor movement. There's a whole line of uh, pretty hostile anti-labor legislation that we're facing. I think we're all going to have to stand together to cope with this. I certainly want to assure you of my willingness to stand by your side in this effort. You know, I think one of the best summations of the Republican philosophy of economics was made by good old Harry Truman. He called it the Republican trickle-down theory of economics. You probably remember that. Old well, Harry said, you know, the Republicans believe in this trickle-down theory of economics. That is, if the rich folks on top make enough money, then sooner or later some of it's going to trickle down to the rest of us down below. <laughs> so. I think if you'll stand with me, I'll stand with you. I'll get after that Republican trickle-down theory of economics, and I'll do the best job I can for you in the U.S. Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boeing. I was especially pleased, as I'm sure the rest of the delegates over the last statement that you made about the attacks that are being made upon the labor movement. And uh, for the delegates' benefit, I sent to each one of these candidates an editorial that appeared in the FLCIO News a few weeks ago about some of this bad legislation and some of the things that some of our enemies were attempting to do. Uh, one, uh, of course, uh, the fact that they don't like uh, to see people that are on a strike receiving food stamps. And we can expect in the future to see a continued effort towards denying people that are forced out on strike to receive food stamps. And I want each one of the gentlemen that we have endorsed to understand that one of the most important things that we feel that uh, they might be confronted with as the fact that the Congress might, again, make an attempt to make it impossible for working people to be on food stamps. And I sincerely hope that you will stand with us on this. I point out to you, as I have to other people, that the members of the trade union movement are taxpayers. Each and every one of us pay taxes into the United States. And we have many people 
who get food stamps, who pay no taxes. And that's our argument. We feel if we pay taxes, and if we're forced out on strike, then that we're just as entitled to people, uh, any other people, to draw food stamps. I just want to remind you that before I introduce the next speaker while it was on my mind. This time it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you an old friend. Senator Ellis Bodrine and I have been friends for many, many years. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor has already uh, done a good job of describing his past history and background, but he's been a friend of organized labor ever since I've been president of the state organization. And I want you to know that he stood with us through thick and thin, and as we pointed out in that report to you today, in 1960, he was one of the few <coughs> members of the Senate that had the guts, if you please, to vote against our so-called right to work law. And it's with a great deal of pleasure that I present this gentleman to you at this time, Senator Bodron. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here with you. It's my privilege to have you invite me. This is not the first time that you've shown me the kindness to invite me to your conventions, to your gatherings. <coughs> Excuse me. This is not the first time that you have allowed me to speak to you. And in view of the fact that you have heard me speak on several previous occasions, there may be many who would say that inviting me back uh, reflects adversely on your judgment. I want you to understand I'm not one of those who thinks that. <laughs> I'm grateful to you for your endorsement. I have felt for a long, long time that the people in Mississippi who are members of the various labor unions band together to promote their own interests. Well, my friends, who demonstrated it on many, many occasions, I hope that I have returned your friendship. I hope that I've demonstrated to you that I want to be your friend. I'm grateful to you for your endorsement. I'm grateful to you for the contribution that you made, the more tangible, more physical, contribution. Uh, I'm sorry, Claude, that you had to take the wastebasket out of the ladies' restroom. I want you to know that in my house, at my house, in the backyard, I've got a 55-gallon drum. <laughs> if it would be of any help to you, I can get it over here this afternoon. <laughs>
he spoke, he, he turned up the volume a little bit and that voice said louder. But after that happened about the fifth time, he realized that he was being heckled. So he said, gentlemen, and this was back before the days of women's suffrage, and before the days that ladies went to political gatherings, he said, gentlemen, permit me to depart briefly from the course of my intended remarks to say to you that when the day of judgment has come, and when the Prince of Peace returns to earth to walk again upon the water, and the angel Gabriel stands at the head of the golden stairs and sounds the clarion call on his silver trumpet. There'll be some damn Tennessee Republican to yell louder. <laughs> now, in essence, that has been the role of the Mississippi Republican Party, to heckle, to harass, but not to contribute. Name me a Mississippi Republican who has ever voted for a program that led to the building of a farm to market road or a superhighway. Name me a Mississippi Republican if you can who has ever voted for a program which led to the building of a classroom or a dormitory at a junior college. Name me, if you can, a single member of the Mississippi Republican Party who has ever voted for a program that has led to the building of more and better hospital facilities for the state of Mississippi. If I may mention to you briefly, when Lieutenant Governor William Warner and I first went to the legislature, the state of Mississippi appropriated out of its general fund less than $50 million a year for the entire operation of our state government. The session of the legislature, which closed in April of this year, appropriated in excess of $425 million eight and a half times as much. Now, that growth in government has not been un unorganized. It has not been disorderly. Let me give you a few other facts and figures that I think will be significant to you. In the decade between 1951 and 1961, per capita income in the state of Mississippi increased by only 50%. In the decade between 1961 and 1971, per capita income in Mississippi increased by more than 130%. There was not a member of the Mississippi Republican Party in the city halls or the county courthouses or the state capitol or the national capitol who contributed a single vote to that result. Only a few years ago, we had only 7,500 hospital rooms in the state of Mississippi. Today, we've got 18,000, many of them built in large part with state and federal funds not one member of the Mississippi Republican Party had anything to do with supporting any one of those programs. In 1951, we had slightly more than 8,000 students enrolled in college in the entire state of Mississippi. Think of that, 8,000 students in 1951 were enrolled in all of our institutions, of our, our, our colleges and universities. Today, there are three state universities, each of which have more than that number. We've got more than 41,000 students enrolled today in our colleges, as opposed to 8,000 20 years ago. 
to accommodate them, and they are taught by professors who are making far greater salary than they made 20 years ago or 10 years ago or even five years ago. And to do that, the state of Mississippi has to build a lot of buildings with state money and with some federal money. We had to issue some bonds, and on occasion, when it was absolutely necessary, we had to raise some taxes. And I want to say that your organization, when it was for a good cause, came to us and said, now, we don't like to pay taxes any more than anybody else, but we're for education at every level, and we will support you in your fight to increase taxes for these particular programs. There was not a single member of the Mississippi Republican Party who had anything to do with the votes that enabled the growth of our universities and colleges. We've got now more students in grade school, more students in high school, more students in junior college, and more students in senior college than we've ever had before. And what is significant about it is that they are all taught by, by more and better paid faculty than they've ever had before. And a larger percentage of our college graduates than ever before remain in the state of Mississippi after they have got their education, which is an expensive thing for the state of Mississippi. And it used to be that we invested the money to educate them, and then they left because there wasn't anything for them to do here. But that has changed, and more and more of them are remaining in Mississippi and finding jobs in Mississippi because the number of jobs in this state in the past five or six years has grown by more than 200,000. And, and nobody, nobody in the Mississippi Republican Party at any level has had uh, ever cast a vote for any piece of legislation that has made that economic growth possible. In the first six months of this year, Governor Warner, in your administration, sir, and in the <coughs> time that Ben Stone and I sat in the Senate, and in the time that was profiting by the efforts of federal funds that David Bowen had worked to bring into the state of Mississippi. In the first six months of this year, more money has been committed to in new industry and expansion of existing industry than in any previous year of our history. And not one single member of the Mississippi Republican Party, from the city hall to Washington, has contributed anything to any of the programs which over the years has brought this happy situation about. And yet they say to you, turn out the people that you know. Turn out the people that have produced for you. Repudiate David Bowen, who set up an efficient organization and brought us three or four dollars from Washington for every one that we sent there. Repudiating for a man who's never held a public office at any time and never contributed in any way to the growth of this state or to the growth of this nation. And they say, repudiate Ben Stone, who has served admirably and effectively and diligently, not only his county, but his whole state for five years. Repudiate Ben Stone for a man who's never held an elective office who's never voted on an amendment, much less a bill. And in my case, they send a young man, and they say, repudiate Ennis Bodron, who has worked for you for a quarter of a century, for a young man who uh, was once elected college cheerleader. why and the only answer they can give you is we think we're going to elect the president 
and we can work for the Republican president better than other people can. Because you know, I'm now serving with the seventh governor that I've served with since I've been a member of the Mississippi legislature. And I never once thought that I was elected to represent the governor. I thought I was elected to represent the people. And if I'm successful in my candidacy for the United States Congress, I'm not going up there to represent the president, whomever he is. I'm going up there to represent the people of the 4th District of Mississippi. And when the, and when the president, <laughs> and when the president, whoever he may be, makes a proposal which in my judgment is for the best benefit of this district and this state, I'm gonna support him every way I can. And when I believe he's wrong, I'm gonna oppose him as I've done governors in this state. <laughs> I suspect I've talked longer than I meant to. Uh, although I said it, it really hasn't seemed very long to me. Now, my uh, opponent and some of the other Republicans have had some $500 place demos and they have brought in some folks from neighboring states to endorse them and they're gonna bring in some more dignitaries from way off up there to endorse them. I'm glad that I can get endorsements from good people that have known me all their lives. I'm glad David Bowen and Ben Stone can get the endorsement of folks like you. And I'd rather have your endorsement and the endorsement of people that I've grown up with and I've worked with all these, all these years and the endorsement of my friend William Wunner, with whom I have been close since we were at Ole Miss. I'd rather have y'all's endorsement than the endorsement of every prominent Republican in the United States. Because it's you all and the other people in this district and in this state that I want to work for and I want to work for in Washington as I have worked for you in Jackson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator, for a job well done. And I can personally testify that the man's telling the truth. I've been around some time myself. I can verify the fact that he does not represent the governor's office on occasion. I can think of one particular governor that did not appreciate our senator, our candidate for Congress too much just a few short years ago. Because he disagreed with his program financial highway system in this state and he stood up for the right thing for the people of Mississippi and consequently uh, he incurred the wrath of that governor. Ellis, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today and have you make those remarks. Our next speaker <coughs> has been talked about. He is now uh, in the cleanup position known him personally five years. I've had the pleasure also to work with him in the state legislature since he's been there. And I can also verify the remarks made by the other gentlemen, including the Lieutenant Governor, that Senator Stone has also been a very progressive-minded senator and a very effective senator. And the people from his district know it, and they went to work for it in no uncertain fashion, and uh, it was a tough battle down there to uh, get him through the second primary, and then we realized that it's going to be an even tougher battle to get you there in November, but I want to show you one thing, old buddy. We're going to do it all, we're going to give it all we can as we are for the rest of the candidates. So at this time, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you 
I endorse candidate to fifth district, Senator Ben Stone. Senator Thank you, Governor Winner. Bodron, Senator Bodron, Mr. Bowen, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here with you once again today. I want you to know before I start how much I deeply appreciate all you have done for me in my first two campaigns. I can truthfully say that I have not had more diligent workers than some of the people in this room in all of these many months that I've been campaigning. And I appreciate very much your reaffirming your stand on behalf of Ben Stone here today. I will never, never let you down with your confidence. might say batting cleanup uh, is a good position to be in. I always, uh, being a, an S and down at the end of the line, always sat in the back of the classroom from my first grade all the way forward. And when I speak, I always speak last because of my name. The only thing I can say about it, though, is that when I go on that ballot, I'm the last name on the ballot too, and that's not a bad place to be in. <laughs> now, Senator Bodron and Mr. Bowen, who are very good friends of mine, have told you a great many things here today. And I'm not here, I hope, to repeat what they have said. I have worked for the last five years very closely with Senator Bodron. I admired his stand from the first day I was there. And uh, I might add to what Claude was saying just a moment ago that when the nasty 21, as they called us back in 1968, my first year, blocked what we thought was a preposterous program, much too big with much too heavy taxes, on the people of the state of Mississippi, that I had the privilege of, of standing with Senator Bodron in that number of 21 and taking the abuse along his, uh, along his side. I learned him well at that time. I know him better now, and I admire him very much. Now, Mr. Bowen came to state government at the same time that I did. And I have always been very interested in his field at that time, which is obtaining money for the state of Mississippi from the federal government. And David did it well. And I was proud to be able to work with him and to get to know him at that time. I think out of that, I learned a great deal about the federal government and about, of course, the needs of state government. And when Hurricane Camille hit the Gulf Coast, I was able at that time <coughs> to step in and to obtain money from the federal government to help to rebuild the damage that was done to all of the counties in my fifth district. I worked side by side with city officials, county officials, state officials, and mi on many, many occasions <coughs> appeared before federal agencies, bureaus, and worked with the various agencies <coughs> in trying to obtain money for the 5th District to rebuild that damage. I can assure you that David and Ellis and I We'll do our best on your behalf when we go to Congress, and we'll go as a team. Now, I'm not going to, as I said before, go into a lot of detail, but I think there are a few things that we ought to bring in perspective here today. You know, when I started this campaign, 
I felt very strongly that my position was one of going to, to Washington to serve in Congress to represent the people of the state of Mississippi in trying to help in the orderly growth and development of my district and of all of the districts of the state of Mississippi. And to go there and to be a strong voice to stand up and speak for you when it was needed on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. Now, that was the theme of my campaign. I told the people that I was interested in them and that that interest would last not only through this campaign, but through the years that I spent representing them in Washington. And I outlined for them, as I think these other candidates have also done, that I would be in Washington, but that during that congressional recess each year, that I would be in every county in the district at a well-publicized place so that you, the people, can come to see your congressman and to talk to him and to let him know how he can best serve you. I told them also that during those many months that I would have to be in Washington and would not be able to have this personal contact, that I would have full-time congressional district offices in the district so that you can go there and in flesh and blood see someone who can help you if you, have, if you need help with your veterans pension, with your social security, or with any of those multitude of things that a congressman can do and should do on your behalf. And I told you that I would organize a system by which any person in their own home could call free of charge to my office in Washington when they had a problem or when something needed to be done. And I think that this personal attempt on my behalf to personally serve the people of the district, coupled with the experience that I had had in the Mississippi Senate and my experience as an active trial lawyer for the last 11 years and my experience in working with the agencies and departments of federal government, state government, and other local governments is the reason why the good people of my district saw fit to elect me as the Democratic nominee. It appears, though, now that the battleground has somewhat changed. My Republican opponent cannot say these things. I don't know how he feels about representing the people because he doesn't say that. I don't know how he feels about his qualifications because he doesn't cite them. The only thing that he sees fit to do is to tell the people of our district that the Democratic Party is no good and that President Nixon is going to be elected and that we need to send someone up there who is going <coughs> to support President Nixon. Now to me, that insults the intelligence of the people of my district and of the people of the state of Mississippi. <laughs> Our people need a representative, not the President of the United States. And I have said on occasion after occasion that I would represent the people and not the President and that I would 
look at his programs as he as he gave them to the Congress. And I would vote for or against his programs on the basis of whether I feel it's right or wrong for the district and the state and our nation. And on that basis only. And that I felt that anyone who was tied to support a president could not support the people of the district. And I do feel very strongly that that is the case. But he's attempting, just as these others are, to grab on to the coattails and try to be carried into office with what he thinks will be a landslide for the president. You know, that happened one time before in Mississippi. And we elected one Republican. He lasted two years. We wasted two years of valuable time that we could have used in gaining seniority, in gaining experience, and in gaining position in Congress. You know, the president won't be running two years from now. Maybe these Republicans from up north might still be coming down into my fifth district and into the other districts trying to tell our people how to vote. But they won't be on the ballot this time. And I believe that what we need to do is what the first man told me whose hand I shook and asked to vote for me in this whole campaign in what seems like many years ago. I asked him if he, if he would vote, for, if he could vote for me, I'd appreciate it. And he said, well, I tell you what, I think we need a young man up there. He said, we need somebody who's going to stay up there and go gain some seniority and going to get back those committee chairmanships that we're going to be losing. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, at that time, I realized just how important it was to be a member of the Democratic Party. Because you know, only as a Democrat can you gain seniority that counts because the Democrats are, they have been, and they will be the majority party in Congress. <coughs> Even my opponent two nights ago admitted that on, on the same stand where I spoke. And you got to understand that when Congress is organized, that first day, as David said, when you vote as to whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican, when you choose the Democratic Party that day and you become a member of that organization that has the majority vote in Congress and will have, you choose to be a member of the party that from its own numbers will select the president pro tem of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, every committee chairman, and every committee sub chairman, subcommittee chairman. You know, the Republicans as minority party don't have any chairman, subcommittee, or full committee chairman. Now just what that means to us, I think, can best be illustrated by what I hope will be my predecessor in, in office, Mr. Palmer, who enjoyed the chairmanship of the Rules Committee, which is a very powerful committee in Congress, perhaps the most powerful. He stayed there 40 years, and he did have that committee chairmanship. But do you know, if he'd been elected, as a Republican 40 years ago and stayed there for 40 years, he would never have spent one day as chairman 
of the Rules Committee or of any other committee in Congress. That's how important it was for him to be a Democrat, and that's how important it is for us to elect Democrats here in the state of Mississippi. And I think that, although I don't want to speak too long, it's important for me to go into one other thing that vitally affects my district. My opponent is saying, as are the other Republicans, that it would be in the best interest of the state of Mississippi to have a Republican Congress. Well, you know, if a Republican Congress were elected, we in Mississippi would lose every committee and subcommittee chairmanship that we now hold. That deserves going into, and I won't at this time, I think you need to know about it, but I do want to say one thing about it. That includes Senator John Stennis's chairmanship of the Armed Services Committee. Now, the two largest employers in my district are the federal government and Ingalls Shipbuilding Corporation. The federal government, through its veterans facilities, its air bases, and its other military installations, completely and totally dependent upon what the military does through that committee that John Stennis of Mississippi had. And I can say that I've been to Washington several times to see him about what might happen to this, that, or, other, or this other base that they were either trying to close under a Republican administration or to cut back the number of people we had. The second employer, Ingalls Shipbuilding Co Corporation, completely and totally dependent upon military <coughs> contracts, federal government contracts for shipbuilding, 23,000 workmen. Senator Stennis is the one who protected them on the floor of the Senate when Margaret Chase Smith got up on the floor and tried to take the last $128 million contract away from Ingalls. If he lost that chairmanship, it would go to mainly to Margaret Chase Smith, who introduced that legislation. And I just want to remind you one thing that she said on the floor of the Senate made many speeches and she said many things about Ingalls. <coughs> One stands out in my mind. She described the workmen at Ingalls as a bunch of rednecks hardly capable of learning welding, much less the intricacies of shipbuilding. Now that's who we're going to turn over the future of my district to if the Republicans take over control of Congress. And I, for one, hope that it never happens and I'm going to do my best to see that it does not. Ladies and gentlemen, I could go on and on here today. I'm not going to. <coughs> I want to tell you once again how I deeply appreciate all that you've done in the past, what you've done here today, and what you're going to do in the future. You know, it takes a lot, of in, a lot of work between the endorsement and the election to elect a candidate. I hope that you feel that it's worth that too. And I'm sure that your presence here today tells me that you do. Thank you very much.
this time we'd like to just simply tell you that we're going to do everything we can to help you. We'll be wanting to meet with each one of you individually, with your campaign managers, very near future. Uh, we intend to put our forces together. We don't believe in making endorsements without trying to deliver the vote. We want everybody here to understand that, that uh, we're going to do our best, our level best, to see that you do, in fact, become a member of the Congress of the United States. And if you don't make it, it's not going to be our fault. Thank you very much. certain people present, I guess, we have a number of guests present, and uh, I didn't introduce them by name because of the time situation. I just want you to know we appreciate your presence, and that we hope that you also will join with us in helping us carry out endorsement of these candidates. And I also want to say that our rules committee overlooked the most important rule, and that was that we did not mention in the rules that international representatives had the same privilege of addressing the convention as any other delegate. I want to apologize for that oversight. In the past, in our rules, we've always allowed international representatives the same privilege as of other delegates uh, to address the convention. Now, according to the rule that you adopted, it'll take a two-thirds vote to change the rule. And at this point, I would suggest and recommend that a motion be offered that the men's be ruled, whereby uh, am rules be amended, whereby international representatives should be allowed the privilege of addressing this convention if they see fit. Can I get that motion? Motion so made. I got the motion. Is there a second? Second, brother. Any discussion on the motion? Not all in favor of changing the rules of this effect signified by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carried and so ordered. I deem it by unanimous vote. Now the international representatives have the privilege <coughs> of addressing this convention at this late hour if they see fit. We still, <laughs> we still <coughs> have some business that we want to talk about. I realize the hour is late, and we're going to try to wind this convention up as rapidly as we can. Most of the work uh, that lies ahead will depend upon the ability of our people in these three districts to properly organize themselves and this matter of getting the vote out. And you can expect the full cooperation of the state of FML CIO in each one of these three districts. We are already in the process of doing what we can to assist you. We recently met with the powers that be in Atlanta, D.C., Sal Barkin and his staff, Thomas Knight, Bob Woods, and myself, and a couple of members of uh, Bob Starnes and Sarah and Joe Ellens, and uh, we <coughs> met.
met with these gentlemen, with everybody, and then we met with them in private. And I can report to you that we came away from there in pretty good shape, much better than I expected. Uh, we've been promised $5,000 of dues money that we can spend to help you get the vote out. We've been promised some voluntary money for each one of these candidates from the National afl cio Coke Fund. I can't tell you exactly how much yet because they haven't arrived at that figure yet. We have wrote each international union and asked their cooperation and their help, financially and otherwise. We have received some contributions, free money, money that can be given directly to the candidate from a number of international unions. But there are a number of international unions who have not yet responded to our request. As I told you this morning, we have received some contributions from some local unions out of their treasuries to help us get the job done on educating our people and getting out the vote. And what I'm trying to say to you here now today before Mr. Knight wraps this convention up, which I've assured him he'd have the opportunity to do under good and welfare, is that we want you to do what you can. Number one, if you haven't already done so, Contact your international union and see if you can't get some financial assistance from them. Number two, we need manpower and we need woman power. We need at least two full-time men with automobiles in each district. And at the present time, we know that we only have two. And maybe a third, which means we need two more. We have engaged the services of Amy Hollowell to work to help organize the women. We're working very closely with Bob Woodson and the A. Philip Randolph Institute to help in his area. And we've got to put it all together to win. I think that uh, the speeches made by the candidates were excellent in certain respects, but there's been a few things that neither one of the candidates said that ought to be said about the need of maintaining the control of Congress. And I don't think that that can be stressed too much.
that we can maintain control of both houses of the Congress. Do we understand one another? Now, we are going to have our work cut out for us. Make no mistake about it. Nobody recognizes this any more than I do. And as Bob Woodson so adequately stated in Atlanta, we're going to find ourselves in, some, in bed with some people we don't like to be in bed with and that we can't afford to go to sleep with. That's right. That's where we are. What we have got to do is to concentrate on the election of these three gentlemen. We have got to have people that want to support McGovern supporting our candidates. We have got to have people that want to vote for Richard Nixon supporting our candidates. And we have got to have people that don't want to vote for either damn candidate supporting our candidates. That's what we got to have. Democrats who have told me I can't vote for either candidate for president. I said, yeah, but you can darn sure go out and vote for a candidate for Congress. He says, well, I intend to do that. I said, well, then I feel a little bit better about your situation. Now, I'm going to touch on something else briefly, and I'm going to be finished with my remarks, and then we're going to try to bring this thing to a close. Tom, I think what we what we'd better do is try when we're trying to get a meeting to send somebody off to the game. But what I think we'd better do in that situation is to close to that meeting and get Amy lined up with our central body officers at a later date because time is running late. You know, that's that's the kind of situation that we're faced with. But <coughs> there has been some announcements already made in the press about the plans for the McGovern organization in Mississippi. And in last night's paper, I don't know how many of you got a chance to read the Daily News last night, I read a story about their plans and that a gentleman by the name of Wesley Watkins had been appointed as the coordinator of a labor committee for McGovern in Mississippi. Now, Mr. Wesley Watkins is one of the gentlemen that I referred to earlier as having sabotaged our efforts to unify the party in Mississippi. And I've talked about this matter with some of our labor people that want to support McGovern. in Mississippi, by damn it ought to be headed up by a labor representative. And not a gentleman that has never been identified with organized labor in Mississippi. That's my recommendation to you on that subject. Now, I hate to say this, but there might be some people around that would like to organize a committee for Richard Nixon. And you're also free to do the same thing. But I hate to know that we had a labor representative heading up that kind of committee. <laughs> Tom, do we need any announcement, anything that we need to make now before I turn it over to you? We thank the committee this morning. I have neglected to thank all the committee happy you remind me of this. I want to thank all of the committees for all of the hard work that you've done, the sergeant at arms for all of the hard work that you've done. I think we've had a very good convention. We deeply appreciate your presence here today. 
we know we can expect your cooperation in the future. We know with your help that we're going to have three winners in November, regardless of who the next president is. So, Tom, with those uh, remarks, uh, we're now under good and welfare. I first, before I bring you on to wrap it up, I'd like to find out if there's any delegates present would like to have a word to say before this happens because I'm going to let our Coke director finish this thing up and send you on your way as the proper kind of message. Brother Taylor? Mr. Chairman, I don't want to prolong this convention, but it was intimated <coughs> that uh, we would probably get with these three candidates along with our chairman, county chairman, and at one time we had co-chairman representing organized labor. I would like to see that implemented at an early date in which we would meet with these respective candidates along with our county chairman, with the co-chairman who represents labor sitting in that type of a conference to talk about ways and means. Very appropriate, Brother Taylor, very appropriate. We had hoped to, at luncheon during the luncheon, we have tried to have lunch with the three candidates and talk about this. It was impossible to do so. I'm glad you mentioned it. What we'd like to see you do in each three of the districts, the chairman, the, the committees in the three districts, we want to set up a meeting with each candidate whereby Tom Knight and myself and probably Amy Hollowell and Bob Woodson can be at your meeting. I talked about the individual candidates about this. And we need to do this as soon as possible. So you go to work in your situation with David Bowen. The people in the 5th District and the 4th District do the same thing. We want to sit down and map it all out. We're going to have to shape the program up according to the money that we've got to spend. That's the reason I'm making this appeal for more money. We don't have enough, enough money to do everything we can. But as a matter of necessity, we need to have a meeting as you've described, especially with the candidate, his campaign manager, and other people in his organization in a meeting to work out strategy at least for the last three to four weeks of the campaign. So you go to work on that. Anybody else? Brother Woodson? For God's sake, don't fall down and break a leg. You want to talk about them people you don't like to sleep No, I, I didn't want to say anything like that, Claude. I just want to uh, mention the fact that uh, we will, as the A. Philip Randolph has accused, be working uh, very diligently in this election. We need the support of all of you from across the state. Now, you'll probably be getting letters to and letters uh, in the near future concerning the objectives of our program, and uh, we wish that you would respond and help us out as much as possible. And I'd also like to announce that I need to talk with the black delegates here today for about 10 minutes after the meeting of that in, in the corner of the room over here. I only owe you for just a few minutes. I also like to announce that uh, uh, the A. Philip Randolph Institute, in conjunction with the state of the CIO, will have a young lady working in this effort too. Uh, she's Miss Goodman Simmons from now at Pascagoula, Mississippi. Would you just stand up a minute, Miss Simmons, and let them see you? She'll be helping us out during the election too. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. That was an oversight on my part, and I'm not, uh, not uh, making that announcement myself, but it should have been made by you anyhow. Now, do we have any anything else, anybody else, before I turn it over to our co-director, the Horn? I would like to, to uh, I would like to announce uh, as a uh, program committee chairman. I'd like to announce that the A. Philip Randolph Institute is sponsoring a banquet on the 28th of October at the Masonic Temple. I'm sure Brother Woodson forgot that. So we are asking that um, 
all the black delegates within the uh, trade uh, union movement, as long as anybody else that would like to, to attend this uh, uh, banquet. The tickets is three dollars and fifty cents each, and uh, we'll have our guest speakers from out of town, uh, Norman Hill, who most of you know, uh, along with other guest uh, speakers. So we invite all of you to come out and help us out in that banquet. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. I'm sure that I'm sure that Bob would appreciate for me to give his organization a plug. There might still be some unions around the state that have some good active black members that uh, are not members of your organization that don't know about it and that you'd like to extend to them an invitation to join, right? right. All right, so any union present, if you have a good active black trade unionist in your organization that wants to get in here and work with them, and help them do an effective job, refer them to Bob Woodson. All right, at this point, I'm gonna call on our distinguished Coke director, Thomas Knight, to wrap the convention up. I know he's got a message for you. Brother Knight. Wait, you're tired. If you'll bear with me just a minute, we'll get it over with. I don't know if you realize it or not, but history was made here today, this afternoon, when in our lifetime have we assembled, when we had three candidates for Congress, all on the stage at one time, all have sought our endorsement and have received it, and the Lieutenant Governor of the state on the stage at that time also endorsing those candidates for Congress. As you thought about this, history was made here today. Now, we have got a job, and I this this is a heck of a place to be after all the speeches, the good speeches you heard. But I felt like as Coke director, that I ought to put my two cents worth in. We have come here today to talk about what we've got to do to fill three seats in Congress. Listen to this. That have been vacant for a total of 96 years. <laughs> now, I'm not kidding one minute. Tom Abernathy has misrepresented the people in that district for 30, Bill Calmer in the fifth for 40, and this district has been totally misrepresented for 26 years. Now, if that's not 96 years, I'll hush and go call in a hope. Mississippi, <laughs> all of the years that we've been in this organization have been the recipients and the benefactors of labor legislation passed by the Congress of the United States, and every one of those votes have come from outside of Mississippi. Now, don't you think it's high time that we seize the opportunity, that we get the bull by the horn and by the tail <laughs> and anywhere else <laughs> that is supposed to get the job done? I told, I told two of these guys out there today, Incidentally, I'll tell you this, you know, we, we waited on them until some of us almost lost our run. We waited on them, and I told Bill Winter while I was waiting on the guys on the Congress, I said, there's one thing worse than me. I just hope to God we can get these guys to Washington to take the oath of office. <laughs> and I do hope they'll be there. Because as Curtis Orman from West Point said, whatever it takes, we're going to do it. We've got an opportunity to do something for ourselves and to return the faith to our brothers and sisters in this movement all across this country. For the year after year after year, they've sent people to Congress. 
say, well, them old boys made a good speech, and we ripped and read, and we raised cane, and we had a good lunch, and we had good fellowship, and they're going to be elected on November the 7th. We are all crazy. We've lost our mind. We have got to leave here running. And let me say this, short of this meeting that we thought we was going to have, we thought we was going to get the people that's going to work in full time together with the Central Labor Council also. Let me in do this, and this will suffice for the time being. If Amy thinks she can get up about 3 o'clock Monday morning and be in Jackson by 5, then that's all right. If it's a little late 5, it'll be too late. But listen, the, I'm talking now primarily to the officers of the central body in the three congressional districts. We will be calling you shortly. Now, she cannot wait for you to have a regular membership meeting. She will be making an appointment to come to your area, and you will be expected to gather up your officers in the wives, daughters, sweethearts, sisters, in-laws, outlaws, grandmas, and who else. We have put our reputation on the line. It's on the line. It's done now. If you it is too late now. <coughs> so if we call you up in the next seven weeks, we got seven weeks from Tuesday, I believe. If we call you up and ask you to do a little something, would you grab your best hope? your best hope, your very best hope, and do everything you can. And let me repeat again for the folks in the first and third district, you are not left out of this battle. Remember what I said. You got members, you got friends, you got neighbors in the other districts, and then there's 1974. They got money too, this is right. And we'll even take a donation from the first and third district. We may have no problem getting us to accept it. As a matter of fact, I can't take it before right now. <laughs> but 
we have got to remember that we have accepted a responsibility here today. And that responsibility is simply this. And I'll repeat one more time the phrase I borrowed from our brother from West Point. We had better listen. Whatever it takes, we better do it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I think everybody agrees that you did, in fact, wrap it up. Now, that completes the business of the COPE Convention, but we have one other little item that we want to uh, talk about. We want you uh, to, uh, I'm sure you are interested in a report on it. Uh, we've asked uh, all of you to cooperate with us, with the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, and assisting them in the boycott of fair made products. And I've assured Brother James Jackson that uh, he'd have an opportunity before we adjourn this convention to uh, have a few words to say to you. He wants to thank you for what you've done, and I think he also wants to report to you on the progress of the boycott. So, Brother Jackson, it's all yours now. Thank you, Claude. I promise you I won't keep you very long. One announcement I'm making for Brother George Johnson, there will be a meeting at the IUE Hall tomorrow at 3 o'clock on the fair boycott here in Jackson. There will be another meeting there, and there fair meeting may have to start a little late, but he says it is still scheduled for the IUE Hall. Before I make my remarks, I also have with us in the audience the coordinator of the fair problem for the states of Alabama and Mississippi, Mr. C.A. Buster Smith of Nashville. Will you stand up, Buster? If Buster happens to call on any of you in your local union or your central body, I would personally appreciate if you do assist them in helping with this problem. We certainly want to thank you for what you have done in this campaign against FAIR. They're the world's largest maker of pants. And you know, sometimes the black people think they've been mistreated. You ought to try being a Mexican-American. That's what most of FAIR workers are. Most of them still...